And so I think what we want to start in this yes, yes, yes. session uh, today is really, you know, introducing a VPP 101 today. And we have time uh, to do that today. And we also have time the rest of the year to get into more details um, as the conference schedule rolls out with neighbor request and like and meetings in the south and meetings in lots of other places. Um, I think that, you know, some of the some of the uh, uh, use cases that we're highlighting today are, you know, residential virtual power plants, uh, electric vehicle uh, virtual power plants, CNI virtual power plants. And I think that one of the things that does ring true to me is that virtual power plants for a long time were a solution uh, waiting for a problem. Um, and I think a lot of those problems were more easily solved by, you know, natural gas peaker plants or uh, other uh, types of things. I think today with the amount of electric vehicles that are getting be added to the grid every month, there seems to be a recognition not only by the utilities and the regulators, but also by the ISOs and RTOs that without uh, managing that load, uh, we really are choosing the high cost path. Um, and so I think there is a recognition as seen by how many people have entered the room, I really appreciate all of you being here, that this is the right time to start talking about what a rollout might look like and you know the role that uh, the Department of Energy might play in uh, in our R&D programs, in our standards uh, work, in our loan programs, and lots of other things that we do. And of course, the role that NARUC, the regulators, the utilities, and our uh, partners at SEPA uh, can play in helping to make this a little bit um, more understandable by everybody so we can all be talking um, the same language. With that, Hand it over to you, Sherry. Yeah, I just want to echo, you know, we're excited to be here. Uh, when you called us back in November and said, we want to do this, we want to make it happen, and it, it came together. Um, I just want to say thank you to your staff. Thank you to the many staff members of NARUC, and thank you to Courtney, Yoke, and Andrew from the SEPA team that are here in the audience today. It's It's been a pleasure working with you. Again, this is our first conversation. We're just kicking it off. There's more to come. We've got the July meetings in AROOC. Um, we've got the, the annual meeting coming up in November. So let's have lots of questions, lots of enthusiasm. We want to see some audience participation and, and really learn more together about VPPs and what their role might be. Learn about the policies that we're going to need to put into place to ensure a real smooth transition and really have that resilience and backup power that's available to our customers, our utilities, and our community. So delighted to be here again. And with that, um, I'm going to welcome our first panel. We've got Several panels here today. We're going to be talking about transportation electrification, grid integrated buildings, and DSM, and how VP is all part of that. So I think we're going to get folks mic'd up, and then I will welcome um, David, Leah, Lon, Talak, and Chris to the stage. And I'll be passing out stickers. So get your sticker. Make sure you get your sticker. <laughs> we win valuable prizes? <laughs> They put a booster seat for me. All right. That's for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Greetings all. Um, so, remind me of Oh, you want me to turn it on? Or should I just yell at you? Hello? You're on. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, welcome all. I'm David Nebsha. I work for Trigger at the Loan Programs Office. And I'll have to say this, as at least Rick Cunahan of Andil can testify to, I've been working on this issue. I've been making problems and searching for solutions since Rick and I left college many years ago. Um, and I have never seen in, in all my time on demand side management, distributed resources, and for that matter, utility regulatory issues, I've never seen uh, uh, excitement like this. <clears throat> and uh, I know I'll offend many people before this is over, but I'll just say, uh, no offense to the PV crowd, the PV hockey stick was all manana, manana, and then all of a sudden the PV hockey stick took off amazingly. We see the revolution, the EV revolution. Uh, it's the same demand side. I think it's been more of a steady build over the years and, and decades. And now with virtual power plants, as we just heard from Sugar and Sherry, I, I think are the next. And I was just at Distributech last week and it was oversold 17,000 people. And guess what? And I don't know if you've been there recently, the key topics weren't 
vegetation management anymore, and all the important, all of the essential reliability issues that utilities face, all the energy last week in San Diego was around <clears throat> VPPs and aggregating DERs into a size and scale and quality to make them a utility grade resource, which I would submit is a VPP. And we saw that, I saw that on the trade floor, I saw that on the sessions, and the same here with NARUC. So I just wanna say, I just, Living, living the excitement here, and we have a fabulous panel. Did Andrew or Sherry? Did does everybody have their bios? Because I don't have anybody's bios, <laughs> and I cannot properly introduce them. I'll be happy to pronounce everybody's names right. If we don't have your bios, you can introduce yourself. But Commissioner Leah Marquez Peterson with the Arizona Corporation Commission, uh, Lon Huber. Uh, with Duke Energy, uh, Chris Rauscher with Sunrun, and uh, Tilak uh, Subramanian with um, Eversource. And so uh, we're going to hear from them. We're just going to do a couple. I'm a fed. I get paid by the slide. So you know, have to watch a couple of slides. But I also want to say before I get going, I do want to talk about the topic. But I also want to give a shout out at least to Commissioner McCabe of the uh, and you got, would you put your hand up? We'll hear from you later. Uh, of the Illinois Commissioner, Commissioner Sherger uh, from Minnesota, Matt, just say, and I don't know if there are other, are there other commissioners or senior staff in the room because one, you get to interrupt, you guys, oh, hi, you guys get to enter, oh, hey, Chair, Madam Chair, the, um, you guys get to interrupt whenever you want. This is your party we're crashing. And if you're, so if you're a commissioner or a senior uh, commission staff, please just put your hand up and you can ask a question, you can make a speech, you can tell us how the real world works, whatever it is. So I just wanna, just wanna say that because we're delighted uh, to be working uh, with you. So um, as always, uh, it's a good thing to follow Jigger's lead. We will not define virtual power plants, but I think we all know that we're talking about large aggregations of uh, distributed energy resources writ large, so that means rooftops solar, it means uh, batteries, it means demand side management, it means smart EV charging or vehicle to grid uh, uh, going forward. It's, it, it's all of the above, uh, appliances and buildings. It, I love buildings, but I wouldn't submit we care about buildings as buildings, we care about buildings because that's where smart HVAC, smart appliances, smart EV charging all come together. It takes place at the building. So they're more of a node than anything else. So uh, who's, <coughs> I have the clicker. And then we're gonna let all of you click your own slides when you're up here and you're welcome to sit or stand, whatever your pleasure. So um, the panel uses the delightful name, Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings. It's a lot of syllables, but it's making the point, as I just said, that we need to do a lot of things. We need to make our energy consuming equipment grid interactive so that it's controllable and flexible. Uh, it has to be energy efficient at the same time. And whether it's commercial or residential, what I just wanna say is we wanna use smartness, not just for the comfort or fun or lighting or, or security that it provides. Those are all great uses of smartness. We wanna make sure clean energy and energy affordability get their fair share of smartness. And that's what a grid interactive building is. If one grid interactive building is good, well, many of them must be better. And I think the, uh, uh, one of the issues before us for virtual power plants is what happens when we aggregate grid interactive efficient buildings into communities? And let me interrupt, I see a lot of people taking pictures, Andrew or Jen or somebody, uh, we're distributing the slides in some thumbs up. So feel free to take pictures and we'll make sure we get the uh, slides to everybody who's here. So if we group grid interactive efficient buildings, there can be value. And I will submit the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts. And I will use the example, I am of a certain age, I will use the example of the Beatles. So four really good musicians, but together an exceptional band. The whole <laughs> is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's to me the metaphor for where we're going here. How do we use the value? How do we use the, the powers of large numbers so that when 
Commissioner McKay. Oh, yeah, you guys didn't have a Super Bowl team this year, but um, sorry, mm -hmm. bad example. Anybody here from Kansas City or Missouri? When everybody in, there you go, everybody in Kansas City is watching the Super Bowl. Well, okay, you may, you may, the fridge may be running harder, but somebody else, well, bad example, because everybody in your, in the service area is sure watching, but as you know, that we can, we can uh, be flexible when some people aren't participating, many others are. And that's one of the advantages, same with solar, if a cloud cover comes, that's fine, as long as there are enough participants in the system. And that's what we're trying to do here. And finally, this is not a definition. These are just a few characteristics. I suspect uh, you might have your own, but we're trying to do many things at once with virtual power plants and using buildings to do it so that we can control them for the, all those purposes. We, uh, you heard from uh, Sherry and Jigger earlier for affordability, <coughs> reliability, decarbonization, energy equity, and uh, uh, resilience and all the others. And I just want to just underscore uh, at the end there what's in a different color, at least at DOE and, and the loans office in, in particular. I'll get rid of that thing. No, that's in the way. We're not fussy about this. And uh, we have a lot of resources. We have a lot of lending authority for virtual power plants and for many other parts of the clean energy um, revolution. And um, we, we're we not fussy about definitions. So if you have an idea, you say, I want to do <coughs> this and that, the odds are pretty high we'll say yes. So that's all I want to say. So I am going to end there. And uh, we have questions. And you can enter questions. Andrew, who's going to explain Slido? It ain't me. I am? <laughs> At some point, we will do something. Like, how do they know what to type in? They go to Slido.com. Yeah, the Slido will show up. And then you can answer your question. I said to Andrew, I'm older than Andrew, um, so I said, can people just put up their hands? And he said, it's 2023, mate. So, okay, we'll figure that out. But if you want to put up your hands, we'll read your questions into the mics. So uh, we're going to go next. Commissioner Marquez Peterson, you're up first. Great, hey, thank you. Uh, do, you I, do you have slides? No, I don't, but I can pass it on to Lon. You, you can want. click all you want. Okay, I'll just click through them all. I'll pass it to you. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Leah Marquez Peterson. I'm <laughs> A commissioner from Arizona. So I'm one of about 225 commissioners across the country, many colleagues here, which is great. Thank you to all of those that stayed after the Nehru conference. And thank you to SIPA and to DOE for the invitation. I really do appreciate that. Um, I'm providing one commissioner's perspective on VPP. And I'll start by saying, we don't really use the term VPP in Arizona. So I mean, for those not that are not commissioners or in the industry, I, I think of it as demand response. Um, also, if you envision Arizona, uh, when it's summertime or in the heat of summer, the sun has gone down, the solar panels aren't working, may still be over 100 degrees. So demand response programs or VPPs are, are pretty important to us in Arizona. From my perspective as a commissioner, uh, some of the, the best assistance we can provide, because many of us are very excited about the technology and the direction this is going, is really approving DSM plans, keeping programs consistent, determining the prudency of, of, the, of the programs that the utilities are putting before us. Um, and I understand that role, and it's something that I know is important, certainly to me and, and to my colleagues in Arizona. Um, in Arizona, we have a, a number of programs. Um, Arizona Public Service, which I know is here in the room, I think they're sitting over there, has had great success with their residential program called Cool Rewards. We have over 52,000 residents in there, but a million person um, customer base through APS. And that's one of the greatest, I think, percentage participations that there is out there uh, throughout the, the US. When I sat them down to say, what's the secret sauce? How are you doing this? It really is around customer education and, and customer information. I think they also have some great time of use tiered programs that customers take advantage of for the same reason. We're looking for all we can do in Arizona, especially in the heat of the summer. Um, interestingly, we also have a small business program. We have a commercial program called Peak Solutions. Um, and all of those types of demand response programs, I think, are, are, are vitally important. We need to do more, I think, related to commercial and small business. That's something I particularly want to see. Um, when I asked them, I think it was 66, if I'm correct, Rod, uh, commercial businesses that are participating in Peak Solutions. 
So diving into that, what is that? Is that um, curtailing the use of equipment at a certain time or, or different shifts for the use of some of their large equipment? Arizona continues to be one of the fastest growing states in the country. So we see a lot of semiconductor businesses and, and other types of manufacturers coming to our state. So we really need to get ahead of, I think, commercial and industrial programs from, from my perspective. The other piece that I, I've got some notes sort of make sure I don't forget things. Um, what's important to me is also the all source RFP. We have uh, embraced that informally at this point in Arizona. It needs to be kind of ratified by our commission, which hopefully we'll do in the next, this upcoming year. Um, but all source RFPs allows this new technology and, um, and, and ideas coming forth. And I think participating in uh, how we're setting that stage for our energy future. So to me, also SARF is an important place that our commission can play. Um, we do have issues though, we might be getting into this with questions, but um, to have smart appliances or battery or whatever it may look like in the future, a lot of this is dependent on broadband and high-speed internet. Um, and I see a lot of you nodding. In Arizona, we're probably much the same like your state. Our high-speed internet is very dominated by our urban centers. And so rural Arizona, some of our further away areas, high-speed internet, I think, continues to be one of the greater challenges as we grow demand response programs. In addition, uh, just really customer understanding, customer participation. Um, we're still, I think, post-pandemic and how commercial or industrial customers respond to these programs is also something that's pretty important. Um, I think I'll, I'll wrap it up there and then we can get more into questions, but just know that uh, we continue to focus on reliability and affordability in Arizona. Uh, we need to do all we can to, to handle when we have more demand than we have supply um, and when we're seeing the, these hottest times of the summer. So it's something that really continues to be important for the state of Arizona. But thanks again for inviting me to give comments. Yes, all, right. all right, Lon Huber with uh, Duke. I lead up their customer solutions and pricing. And I have to, is this working? All right. So, so I can get... You're okay. uh, and just as, as Jigger took that courageous stand and said, I will not define VPPs, um, I tend to agree because it's evolving. Uh, and Duke's programs have evolved over the decades before I was born in the 70s. There were uh, the starts of, of the, the programs uh, around uh, AC and emergency uh, demand response moved uh, and evolved to different types of switches and uh, um, use cases moving from emergency to economic uh, dispatch um, from uh, the, the demand side to help on the supply side. Uh, and, and then it's evolved from there to smarter Wi-Fi connected uh, gadgets that are now doing more than just bulk system emergency uh, or bulk system economics, but we're moving now towards local distribution level optimization and, and resource use. So that's that's our, how it's been evolving. The addition of PV has been has been phenomenal to the VPP world in addition to, to smaller scale batteries. So you've seen that that evolution um, and it will continue to, to do so. And it's just going to become more and more crucial that that demand side um, is a core pillar of the resource needs going forward uh, to hit the clean energy targets that, that we need to hit uh, by 2050. So you can see Duke has gigawatts of this stuff out in, in our, our customers' premises. We have over 1 million connected devices today. And I think uh, the last time I checked with Seth at Energy Hub, we had the largest bring your own thermostat program. Hopefully Arizona hasn't hasn't taught me yet, uh, but uh, we're we're really going all in on 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 these devices and then figuring out ways to um, to take it to the next level and to start bundling these these next generation resources with each other. Uh, and we we started with with a great proposal and 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 Sunrun was was a part of this of linking rooftop solar to uh, demand reduction technologies to make sure that. Um, as a household, it, um, it is you know that household is reducing its peak demand, cleaning its supply, um, and providing system benefits. Uh, and so that's uh, that's a smart thermostat to start with. Move to batteries, 
solar energy, and time of use rates all bundled together. So pretty exciting stuff. Um, the <coughs> next one uh, is, is a partnership uh, with Ford on vehicle to, uh, to grid. Um, so it's a vehicle to home and vehicle to grid pilot with the, the Ford F-150 Lightning. Of course, some will be part of that as well. Um, and then the next one is, is something that, that we think is, is um, you know, really popular to low moderate income households that are on a fixed budget. When they have a really high bill due to say, you know, hot weather in the summer, they didn't plan for it, it can put them in crisis. Mm. And so we want to put forward uh, a rate design um, that, that is uh, flat for them so that they, they can plan for it. It's, it's, it's the same price every month, but behind the scenes, there's complex price signals that, that we manage um, with um, in devices that they've enrolled. So the more load flexibility, the lower their monthly price that's locked in. Uh, and so we've, we've uh, launched that one uh, in, in Florida. Um, so really exciting things of, again, trying to get the price signals right, trying to get the technology right, um, and then anticipating what the customer is going to like, because that's the key part. We need customers to adopt this, right? So we we've got to we've got to make sure that um, that we're setting that it up to to anticipate what they would like, and and then delight them with the the customer experience around it. Now I'm, I promised Sherry, who's a former consumer advocate just like myself, that I would also bring a little bit of the consumer advocate side. I've actually been a in the consumer advocate world longer than the utility world, so it's easy to do, and and so I would just I want to make sure we we all acknowledge that these resources have a lot of benefits, but it's up to us to figure out how to allocate those benefits. Do we concentrate all those benefits to just the adopter, or do we spread those benefits out to the general body of customers, to non-participating customers, and so forth? And fundamentally, that is the debate in a lot of net metering, you know, spaces and others of where do you and where do you put those benefits? How do you allocate them properly? Um, and so I just want to make sure that we all are cognizant of that and, and think about um, how how these resources can help um, the folks that might not have the privilege to put a battery storage in their garage or have an F-150 like it. So with that, Chris. Real quick, Lon, you, you talked about uh, vehicles to home, uh, vehicles to grid. So I assume that includes smart charging as part of your portfolio. That's right, of course. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, that's gonna, that's the, the first building block. So first, yeah. it's the just static sort of, or, you know, I would say, TOU rates with critical peak pricing, and then managed charging via telematics or a smart charger, um, and then you'd get to the vehicle to grid or home. Chris. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Um, thanks to DOE and SEPA for, for having us here. This is a really exciting topic that I'm sure we could all talk about for the rest of the day. I know I don't shut up about this topic, so I'm excited to, to have this, this opportunity. Um, I'm with Sunrun, and we've been managing DERs for you know, 17 years or so now, and we are a leader in the in the VPP space. Um, as you can see on the slide, there are a number of different sort of flavors of VPPs that we have pioneered at Sunrun. We were the first residential aggregator to bid into a wholesale market in Ice New England, and we operated that uh, that bid this past summer. We also piloted uh, in Massachusetts connected solutions with with National Grid, um, one of Tillock's. Uh, utility colleagues here, uh, putting batteries into Connected Solutions, the Bring Your Own Device program, I think six years ago. Uh, and then we've also signed a number of bilateral contracts with, with utilities to provide VPP services uh, in, a, in a contractual manner. Um, the most recent one of those is in Puerto Rico, where we signed a deal with PREPA, the utility there, for 7,000 homes with <coughs> solar and batteries to provide power to the grid 260 days a year. So this is cycling every single weekday to take uh, the stress off of the system and to defer the need to run fossil fuel power plants. Um, so there's many different avenues to get to VPP services, and there are many different services that VPPs can provide. Generation, capacity, peak production, ancillary services, frequency response, all sorts of different things. And I, I don't think it's the role of the panel to get lost in terms here, because I think that's sort of a useless exercise. But for me, what I like to think of is uh, how can we keep this as simple as, as possible? And fundamentally, what we're talking about here is just putting devices on timers, and in our case, mostly batteries on timers, uh, to provide those, those services that the, uh, that, that the grid needs. And today, for us, it's largely solar and batteries, but in the very near future, um, it's the whole home. 
right? It's aggregating all of the devices in the home together, all of our customers in the country, you know, we have almost 800,000 customers uh, now, and we're the second largest owner of solar assets in the country, believe it or not, we're bigger than every other utility scale developer, except for Nextera. Um, and so aggregating all of that resource together to provide services to the grid. So thermostat, a bi-directional EV, where, the, where Ford's partner on the F-150 Lightning, uh, a battery, um, heat pumps, and providing that as a resource uh, to the grid. And the scale here is, is tremendous, it's huge. A long range F-150 Lightning has 10 times the, power, the uh, capacity of a Tesla Powerwall, right? So you could provide services, uh, just use half the battery and you've got five Powerwalls there in the home and you still have plenty of energy left to, to drive around on. So the scale here is enormous. And I think if I wanna leave the group with one thing, it's that this isn't a future looking thing. This is, you know, we've been doing this for years now in partnership with utilities and there are very simple programs that we can use and we'd like to uh, spread those throughout the country. All right. Uh, the challenge and privilege of going last is I can just say ditto. So, but um, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Peterson and uh, the other commissioners, staff in the room. Thank you for what you do. You guys have one heck of a tough job, especially getting into this world. So I don't want your job. I really appreciate what you do. So thank you for what you do. Coming back from um, the Shibuya attack, it felt like the internet uh, days, giddy days, right? A very overwhelming, a lot of exuberance, certainly a lot of optimism. But for me, at least, it forced me back to the basics. What problems are we trying to solve here, right? In New England, for instance, to give you an example, ISO New England procures roughly 32,000 megawatts through the forward capacity market. A quarter of that is used just through five, less than 5% of the hours in the year, right? So is there an opportunity to reduce the installed capacity requirement, really optimize that? Because that's a very, very expensive way to run the grid. Then you can get into reliability, you know, resiliency, GHG emissions at every level, right? Right down to the municipality, right down to certain vulnerable customer segments or critical care facilities. So how do you actually, and the good thing is DERs provide an enormous opportunity, right? If you can aggregate them, choreograph the dispatch and do it carefully, you know, they can be a huge asset, can really help mitigate this, but you have to do it carefully. As I learned that distribute tech, doing it wrong can actually make things worse. So that is an important point. The some of the programs we have in New England, you know, the traditional uh, ISO level demand response. We do have a lot of retail programs, which you just touched on. One is what we call the daily dispatch, which tends to be a lot of batteries. Just uh, July and August, you know, two hours during the peak hours, we just dispatch it. Then we have what we call more of a bring your own device and pay for performance type program, where it's really a wide portfolio of asset types, right? CNI load curtailment thermal storage, battery storage, you know, EVs through uh, telematics or chargers. And through that, our experience on the ground has been about three fourths of who responds there is largely large CNI uh, curtailment. And off the remaining, a lot of demand uh, thermostats. The EVs, not a lot of EVs were connected. So which brings the question and how do you think we need to think differently about them through managed charging programs and the like for EVs given when and how they are used. And the last point I'll make is which I think everyone touched on is we in this room get very wonky in the program design, the policies and rates and everything else. But we have to really, it's all about customer, how you pull customers into this, right? Not how we put programs out. And this is true for any solutions. I know one of the things you've uh, teed up commissioners around large CNI customers. That was the one we had to go back to the drawing board on. How do you engage large CNI customers? I was at one last week and they think very differently. It's not about that technology. You have to get the finance folks and speak that language. So we'll get into that more later on. Great. Thank you. Now we, um, well, Andrew, does that, I do want to give a shout out by name to the people who organized uh, this uh, today's session. So Andrew Drudonic from SIPA, Jen Downing from the Loan Programs Office, Danielle Sass Burnett, Danielle. Nehruk and Joe Palladino of the Office of Electricity at DOE. I don't know if Joe's physically in there. So thank you guys. 
organizing things. So, uh, Andrew, while you do that and tell people how to do Slido, one of your colleagues will tell me the password on the SIPA iPad. <laughs> So I can read such questions. Thank you. I can do this. I don't know how to do it. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna start out. So look, we we heard a lot about those um, uh, end users, or is it DOE? We say those people who keep messing up our nice science experiments. But um, so so tell me, and, and Commissioner, you and I chatted about this a little bit before, and I won't ask about virtual. You can answer in terms of virtual power plant setting or just a distributed energy resource setting. Well, tell us how, in your sense, in Arizona, how end users engage. Are they aware? Do they care? Are they willing to participate? Or, and if not, of course, the next question is if not, how do we do it? And then I'd like to ask that of all of you. Now, I, I think it, it was very telling as we went through the panel. We've got to keep it simple. It's about lessening demand. It's about me as a family and my children and my husband saving money on our bill. And how do we do that? So how you communicate that or educate each of the families and how that's translated to the commissioners who are voting on your programs, I think is pretty key. In Arizona, whether that's a smart pool pump or HVAC system or interconnecting with electric vehicles or whatever it may, may mean, we've got to keep the program simple and you've got to incentivize the families to participate from a residential perspective. I think it takes a lot more slicing and dicing with the commercial and industrial customers, as was mentioned, because they're really looking at that same bottom line financial situation, but you've got a lot, a lot more um, parameters that need to be in place. Um, I absolutely think there's interest in this, but people don't understand it, and they may not be aware of your program. As I mentioned, that kind of urban-rural split, we certainly feel that in Arizona. So as you're able to expand and have geographic diversity around your program so that it's actually spread out across the territory, I think that that's pretty important also, because I, I do think there's a lot of interest in it. Well, if you, fine, let me just say, oh, we all know, and, and when you, for somebody who referenced this, non-participants benefit too from PPPs, as long as they're air breathers or care about a reliable grid or are trying to avoid the CapEx sure. speakers. So is that part, how does it work for a commissioner and any commissioner can respond? How do you think about their non-participants, both in terms of the cost, but certainly in terms of the benefits that will accrue if PPP shows up yeah. and down? I think theoretically you're absolutely right. I don't think the public understands that though. Yeah. So I think we need to do a lot of work related to educating. So whether that's your 274 <coughs> fellow commissioners, 225 or something. Well, what's that? Yeah, I, I guess it's also we're since this is a national um, space, we're, we're very different commission by commission. I mean, we a lot of us have similar mission in our state. We're a body of five. We're elected. Uh, we're elected statewide. So. We are out there touching the community quite a bit, as are the appointed commissioners, but might be a little different perspective. And we're laser focused on affordability and reliability, um, and reliability being really key. We're sandwiched between California and Texas and other states. California's had, had its issues with rolling blackouts and different decisions they've made in their state, and it certainly impacts ours. I mean, all that is kind of layering on as we support uh, or or modify DSM plans and different programs you put before us. For me, ultimately, it comes down to, yeah, reliability and how do we educate the public about the benefits of these types of demand response programs. On Ms. Tilak, on end users, participants, and non-participants? Yeah. So, so a few things, um, maybe start on the non-participant side. Um, you know, we, we have to think of, at the end of the day, how much are we compensating? What's our cost benefit framework? For energy efficiency and DR, you have cost effectiveness tests and you can get 2.0s, 3.0s. And what that means is that non-participants are saving. If it's a 1.0, sort of break even, right? Um, and so when you think about BPPs, well, maybe you have a community one that you only are paying 10 cents a kilowatt hour for. But for maybe the same technology at a home, you're paying 18 cents a kilowatt hour for. And how, you know, how is that, that fair? You have to look at, at how um, that all hits the cost effectiveness test. And again, where those benefits are going and are you maximizing the dollar to the greatest extent possible? Um, because the climate crisis is gonna take all the resources we, we can throw at it. 
Um, and so you don't want to be inefficient with those resources. And so I think that's what we owe non-participants in all of this. Uh, and then I think in terms of participants, there's, there's definitely a lot of confusion. I think folks saw the, the highlights from months ago with Excel Energy. You had customers that signed up to a thermostat control program that benefited substantially over the years that it was, it was never used, right? So they accrued financial benefits. And then when Excel finally had to call the event, they were, they were upset and they didn't have overrides. So then you can talk about user experience as well. And, and so there you go, you've, you've, you know, you've been paying for this benefit. People either forget about it, they didn't exactly know what they were signed up for. And then it, you, know, you have a, a press that likes sensational stories and it sort of blows up. Um, so we, we have to think of that customer experience. And then we have to know that these things don't, you know, there's, there's some limitations. You cannot run you know, most likely an eight hour thermostat event where you shut off the thermostat for eight hours, right? You know that there's going to be some opt outs as you go past the certain amount of hour thresholds. So we have to be smart. We have to derate these things. We have to understand consumer behavior in the summer, in the winter, on the weekends, on holidays. So this is very, this is complex stuff. So we need data analytics. And again, we need to be in that customer centric mindset as we do all this. And, and again, not forgetting those not for just I think an elected commissioner in Arizona knows not to turn off thermostats for eight hours. I'm, I'm guessing that's your core competency. <laughs> Where I would go is from a participating customer viewpoint, whether it's you know the California heat waves and public safety shutoff events, winter storms in Texas, Puerto Rico, you know, where we have very frequent outages there. Customers are demanding resilient power through batteries. And the adoption rate is following the solar adoption rate. It's, 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 it's really incredible. So if customers are going to want to get those batteries anyway, we can help defray the cost in partnering with utilities <coughs> by enrolling those batteries into grid service VPP programs, paying the participating customer, and thereby reducing the cost of that resiliency, which is what they really want, uh, 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 to the customer. And in many cases, like in California with, with time of use rates, arbitraging their bill on a monthly basis. So it's just saving them uh, on a month to month basis uh, on their bill. And then for non-participating customers, I completely agree with, uh, with the commissioner and, and with Lon that there are enough savings to go around. So it's sort of by definition, these programs should be shared savings programs where some of the savings gets paid to the performing customer or through the aggregator to the customer. And then the rest of the savings goes to the rate base. You know, utilities know what the next marginal unit is going to cost them to fire. So pay the VPP something slightly less than that and don't fire, don't fire that unit. That's very easy in a place like Puerto Rico where the loading order is uh, written down on a piece of paper. But it's also pretty simple in places like ISO New England where all of your costs you know, flow through a single coincident peak hour uh, in the year. So if you just target that, that, that hour as much as possible, you can reduce the cost. Good luck. We'll cover that. Can I? Can, we have a question here that was directed to Lom, but I think it's uh -oh. good for both utilities. If I could put you on the hot seat, somebody wants to know how do the EverSource and Duke investors make money off VPPs? Go first. No, you go first. Okay. <laughs> I like this topic. Why? Be because you always have to understand what incentives does a business have, right, to engage in these things. And I believe that a utility should have skin in the game. And, and because when I try to hire the best talent to work on my teams, if I say, hey, you get to help the company lose money, when, isn't that great for your career? Like, no one's going to join that VPP team if they're there to help the utility lose money, right? And so what we've, what we've had set up in partnership with regulators, consumer advocates in our states is a shared savings model like that, that Chris alluded to. So we basically have a 90-10 split. We get 10% of the net savings and then 90% flows back to non-participants, so 90-10. Um, so that's our model. Obviously, lost revenues you know, is in, included in that as well. Um, but that's a way to get, have, have some skin in the game, make sure that the utility has the right incentives to maximize the deployment of these resources, but also in the most cost-effective manner. As I said, we get shared savings on net benefits, not gross, right? So um, if we say just re really you know, load up on marketing and the, make the incentives very high, there will be no net savings, meaning we won't have any earnings. There'll be nothing for non-participants. So you've got to be very mindful of what type of, of business incentives you're, you're structuring to make sure that everybody has skin in the game and the right incentives to, to really um, make sure that these, these programs um, 
you know, bring that value that Chris mentioned because these can be really win-win programs uh, for participants and non-participants. So the way we are structured in New England is a little bit different than the shared savings model. We, we are in a deregulated environment, so we don't own any generation. And what's for energy efficiency and distributed, uh, you know, DR and the like, what we get is we're kept whole on any basically revenue requirements because of uh, lack of collections because of reduced kilowatt hours. And then we have a performance incentive if we deliver on the uh, outcomes we get rewarded. I think that's worked very well as the New England has really invested heavily in scaling up energy efficiency that models worked very well. As we go fo uh, forward, you know, with VPPs and the like and penetration of EVs, I think there's gonna be a lot more, less on the whole system-wide peak more about local distribution peaks and how do you address yeah. those problems. I don't know that we have quite solved the economic question there. I think yeah. there's, so there's more, certainly more work to do, but I think there's a good framework that's there already. Thanks. The, um... I'm a new, um, I, I'm gonna ask this one as a lightning round question. That we, Well, first I'm gonna ask uh, any of the commissioners in the room, you'll respond if you want to. Are you willing to let your regulated utilities make money off VPVs and or are you willing to penalize them financially if you think they're not uh, meeting your standards on VPVs? Is that, is that part of the mix or, or not quite yet? Anybody you want to tackle that of the commissioners? Anyone else want to tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> Performance regulation? Yeah. Go ahead and see a hand back there. Commissioner Sherger from Minnesota. Uh, we have people online. If you if you'd wait for the mic, please. Thank you. I, um, Matt Sherger, uh, Commissioner of Minnesota Public Utilities Commission. So it's something that we're discussing and looking into. We have um, initial steps in performance-based rate making, where we've established uh, key metrics that we're measuring and tracking. One of those metrics <coughs> is focused on. Uh, demand response, and in that initial order, we um, specifically um, tag the potential for incentives around demand response. So we're in the early stages, but it's something that we're we're certainly open to. So I, I think that question um, that was asked that was just answered is, is really an important one because as a regulator of investor-owned utilities in a vertically integrated uh, state, retail rate regulated state. Um, there isn't a natural incentive for the utility to want to do this. So we're looking for models like the one that Juan described. And before I turn over the mic, I just want to mention the Excel example was not in my state. <laughs> <laughs> I should have clarified that one, yeah. <laughs> and I'll, I'll add to that that in Arizona, we've created a docket related to this. And so we're capturing information. So it is something we're studying also. David, can I just make a quick point on that as well? Which is that no one, no one said the way utilities, no one in the audience said, the, or on the panel said the way utilities should make money off of EPPs is rate basing smart meters or assets or batteries. And I think that's really telling. I'm hoping that that means that's a consensus view that utilities don't need to be doing that. But I would just make the point that your utility does not have smart meters, right? I'm not sure if Duke does or not. But smart meters are not a necessary uh, technology to have VPPs. And in fact, the lack of VPPs is not a technology problem. It's a, it's a policy problem. And I want to put in a pitch at the US Department of Energy with the uh, passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. We have enormous financial resources for utilities and OEMs and other players there. We can't, when, well, we get to be a good cop. We're not penalizing anybody. Uh, we don't have that. That's, that's your, your guys' job. But uh, we do have, whether it's loan guarantees from us at LPO or uh, uh, funds from other parts of the department. So again, we do want to put money, on, uh, US DOE and the US government wants to put money on the table for uh, VPPs. Can one, I add something yeah, to that? I, I wrote it down, so I'd be sure not to forget. But I heard Secretary Grantham speak earlier today also about uh, VPPs. And they have demonstration projects, funding pilots. And she spoke about hosting roundtables for input for from pu public and private stakeholders again this morning. So, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity for your companies to plug in to the work at DOE. So just Great. a little plug for you. Good. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, the one I wanted to do is a, a lightning round. 
is a couple of people have asked in different ways, what, what are the barriers? Okay, they, they love the speeches implied. What are the barriers? Why, why aren't we seeing more of it? So just pick a couple, you know, lightning round. Let's start with TLOC and move down to the commissioner. Just pick a couple of things that you think are the biggest barriers to BPPs. I would, uh, you know, I guess I start with the customer and right. It's what is it? We got to be get off this wonky trip we are on about VPPs or demand response. If you look at the case of large commercial and industrial, as an example, right? Trying to get to the there's a lot of awareness on energy at the shop floor level. Very little at the CFO's office. I can tell you that. So how are you going to get that? And for us. In order to get that, I had to go hire the folks who could go have that financial because utilities typically don't have that in their account executive ranks. So there's a lot of organizational dimension to it. At the end of the day, it's about economics. It has to make economic sense for the customer, and we have to be able to make connect those dots. And to me, I think we can do a lot better job yeah. on that. And okay. that help. Lightning round. Lightning round. Chris. I would say uh, overcomplicating this. You know, if you just take Tilox Connected Solutions Program peak reduction, put it in every utility in the country, we would, we would be halfway there or most of the way there. Um, I, it's valuation, making sure we're actually valuing these resources the right way, knowing that in the future, our capacity is not gonna be fossil heavy, it's going to be clean energy heavy. So how do you make sure you have a level playing field between fossil free customer assets and fossil free grid assets? Cause that's sort of how you do that cost effectiveness test and then speed to market on the regulatory side. I wanted to, to file a program in response to sky high uh, wholesale market prices in one of my states. And, and you know they're like, okay, realistically, this will be approved in about a year and then it'll take a while to launch it. So probably two years. So you miss, sometimes you miss these key moments to get more demand response enrollment just because it, it takes so long to get a program out there. Yep, and I would add ditto, but I'd also add the broadband high-speed internet item I brought up earlier, as well as for the utilities sitting in the room, the real strategic analysis on what the customers are looking for, whether it be residential, commercial, industrial, and that you have the trained folks in place to meet with the right people within each of those customers within your state. Um, how you're incentivizing customers, customer choice, involvement, communication. I wrote uh, also that uh, as we move forward with batteries and so on, just particularly sensitive to the training of fire departments, the working with mayors and councils is, uh, that are fully trained on the utilization of battery storage in homes as we move in that direction. Um, so I think there's just some education that needs to occur. Thanks. The, let, let me go back. You, we, we talked about it. I think Chris used the term flavors, or maybe you did, Lon. When he, so, so you heard what Jigger said, and I said we're very open. But just do, do you feel that um, would you like to see commissions? or uh, other government bodies or utilities pushing certain kinds of VPPs more than others? Do you want to see more solar? Do you want to see more demand side? Do you want to see more CNI? Whatever that means. Do you, would you like to see a push for flavors or do you want let a thousand flavors bloom time? All of the above. We, we, we want anything and everything. We, you know, I think you have to get those, those price signals right. And those, those prices can be either like the rate design or the, the actual like program compensation, you get you get that right and technology agnostic, and then you let the market go from there. Let and me you, tease out yeah. getting prices right. So there's wholesale prices, there's retail prices or tariffs, let's call it. And then you said program participation, program. is that what one would call rebates or incentives? Is that but the same thing? Yeah, and incentives. And sometimes those incentives are tied to, to market. Sometimes they're decoupled because you have distribution values. You don't typically have that in a wholesale market construct. Okay, but l let me push in the sense that if you're not from Arizona and not from California, not that many people have time, not that many residential and small uh, uh, commercial customers have time of use rates. Well, so the, okay, and, so that's a that was a topic that I yeah. was on a panel with like two days ago. And most of them don't want it. I mean, we we well, know that. And that's after. why we have that fixed rate too for customers that don't want that that price risk signal. But you do really need those smart AMI meters for for that. I mean, unless the program costs. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? We, because it, it, there's, I mean, there's there's different. I would disagree with my friend Lon here in, in terms of a, you know uh, many different flavors. Because the, the more different programs with different DERMS platforms, different contracts that we have, the harder it is to participate at scale, right? And so I think it's about a state going with a model that's tested and tried and true and has high participation levels that's adapted for their particular state. 
but a lot of the back end stuff can be the same. So the same Derms platform, the same you know performance obligations, that that type of thing. Um, and I have to give a shout out to some partners, uh, Solar United Neighbors and Vote Solar. They just came out with a new white paper. It's very short, very digestible, high level that shows states, you know, here's a blueprint for how to put these programs in place. So I think the resources are, are out there. Um, and then just on the TOU piece really quickly, there's, there, as you, you know, we know, we've talked, we've debated this forever, but there's two different ways to get at that value. You can do it on the bill with TOU, or you can do it through a good service payment. Uh, which is, you know, revenue as opposed to savings. And I think we're seeing most places head toward the grid service payment side. But I, I do want to clarify, I never said a thousand different programs. I said all the different technologies. You can structure a program Agreed. that handles all the different technologies in one nice framework. So that's what I meant, not a thousand different programs. And can I toss <laughs> in just again that simplicity, smart home, <clears throat> lots of technologies, but marketing it as smart home program or whatever it is, just keeping it simple. I guess what I would say is, as uh, regulators, the best thing you can do is define the problem as precisely as you can, right? And with whatever parameters around it. So what, what are you trying to solve for at a local level or a system level? And then you have BCR models that give some guidance on what level of uh, you know, subsidies you could. What the BCR models don't capture, and this is something we're running into with all the climate legislation in New England, they don't capture GHG stuff. They are very energy focused. They're not GHG uh, focused. So that's something we're going to have to evolve around. How do you capture that benefit? How do you price that into this whole thing? More work to do there. No, interesting. And look, and we all know about the multi many benefits of that VPPs can bring. That's a good thing. The hard part is it's a harder story to tell because it's some of this and some of that and some of the other thing. Right. So what um, again, let me turn to any of the uh, commissioners in the room. Are there uh, do any of the commissioners want to ask any questions or make any comments at this point? I just say I wish you were on that panel on smart rate design because that would have been a good <laughs> contrarian perspective. Yeah, <laughs> no, we don't need better rate design. <laughs> That's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this for a decade. Yeah. <laughs> We're older than we look. Travis will love you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. You're not a commissioner. We have a not uh, a commissioner question. Any commissioners? We only have a couple of minutes left, so I want to give the commissioners. Okay. You've been working for three days. You get you get a. Yes, sir. And introduce yourself, please. Uh, um, my name is Brian Wilkie. I work for National Grid, so it's nice to hear other people say good things about us. Um, you know, I was having this debate with. Um, a commissioner from Wisconsin, I can't remember her name, but um, I think we've had a lot of challenges getting customers to enroll in our programs. And so I would like to hear your perspective on um, default out rather than uh, you know, you, you, every customer gets enrolled in a program like this when they um, connect to your system um, and then making them unenroll when they, they don't like it for whatever reason because i think we you know we've been we structured a managed charging program for evs and we found you know our regulators want the program to be effective but nobody none of our customers want the, the program so not because they don't care about the five dollars of savings yeah. just to be honest like i'm a con ed customer my bill is 140 dollars a month five dollars is meaningless to me uh so i like the idea of socializing all the savings uh across the rate base i think it's an interesting idea but i'd like to hear what you think about like default in as opposed to have to sign up. Yeah, and I'll add, as from a commissioner perspective, with APS specifically, because I've asked this question, um, the ease for the customer. So they opt into this program, they can leave the program without penalty as they'd like. Uh, but they've had great success. People don't feel railroaded into the program. So they have some 52,000 customers taking advantage of it now. So I would keep your customers' <coughs> mind, you know, first and foremost. I think it really depends on what type of program it is. So for instance, a behavioral demand response program, that, you know, and we're launching this soon, that's an opt-out program. So everybody's opted in, you'll receive, hey, it's gonna be a peak day. If you could do anything, that would be great. Um, I think peak time rebates possibly could also be another one where that's just all carrot, there's no stick. I think when you start to deal with really complex rate designs with dynamic prices that can really go up, I think that's when you start to get into that territory of, Oh, I don't know if I should should you know expose everybody to this and and then let them have that one you know bad day in the summer. Um, so I, I think it depends, but I tend to to really 
you know, follow that, the behavioral economics of like when you can make that nudge and it's not going to create those big sensational headlines, then you should, you should have it so that it's, it's more of an opt-out <coughs> setup. So our experience, so in the EB case, uh, we've got a, some programs in a different docket, which basically talks about helping customers put in some subsidies towards uh, wiring or getting a, a smart charger. In that case, yes, we would want to go automatic enrollment saying as part of taking the subsidy, the bargain as you're enrolling in the managed charging program. But where we ran into issues or questions where you got to be navigated a little more carefully is case in point. We try to do that with thermostats. If you give rebates at point of sale, can you automatically enroll them? But then you get into the situation where you've got an elderly customer in a vulnerable state where you're automatically adjusting the thermostat. Those are the things you got to be careful about the automatic enrollment. So we actually didn't do automatic enrollment, which didn't necessarily does mean your penetration goes down quite a bit. But that's the trade off. So real quick, we're back to uh, end this session. So it's a real lightning round, no semicolons, just <laughs> real quick. When we reconvene year after year, but five years from now, what would you like to, to get to where we need to get with VPPs five years out? What would you, what's a single change, single uh, 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 success you would like to see that you think is most important? I'm starting with you two. Uh, I would say, I think it's been touched on at various, it's just an alignment with regulators, us and customers, those are the three entities, right, on what uh, the economic alignment and problem statement alignment and that. Chris? I'd be happy if we weren't talking about VPPs because every home is just all electric and operating in, in sync with the grid. I would like another gigawatt of VPPs on my system within five years. A gigawatt or he's going home. That's right. <laughs> Commissioner? I'd like to see expansion to small commercial customers in a meaningful way. That's great. Now, um, thank you. Before we thank this uh, fantastic panel, I want to point out this. We crossed a new threshold. It was just reported today. The world has spent $1 trillion on electric vehicles. We just hit that. And uh, the, the globally, and the U.S. in particular, is going 50% year on year on EVs. We all witness it. But $1 trillion so far and going up at 50% per year, which means the next panel on vehicles and grid is, uh, is uh, essential. And I hope you stay for that. But before we do that, I just want to thank T. Lock Subramanian from Eversource, Chris Rauscher from Sunrun, Lon Huber from Duke, and Commissioner Marquez Peterson from the Arizona Commission. Thank you all. Don't go anywhere. There's no break. It's a hot, hot swap. Nice job, Chris. Maybe I'll give this to you. That's a clicker. I don't know if you're going first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Hey, Andrew? Yeah. You're, you're teeing up the questions yeah. from the audience, right? Okay. You just, just yeah. open up. It'll be at the end. Just okay. open it up and we'll run mics for that. Okay. Cool. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Let's see, should we go in order? So your microphone is right next to you. There's an on off switch right there. And just turn on your computer box. And then you can get.
started. What's your name, McCabe or McCabe? McCabe. McCabe. Nice to meet you. 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 N
bidirectional electric vehicles as sort of the elephant in the room. We talk about wanting to create a modern grid, a grid of the future, a smart grid, a two-way flow network where data and electrons are being exchanged across various types of actors. We talk about wanting democratization of energy, decentralization of energy, decarbonization. This is going to be a catalyst for that to happen. We see it already happening in other places around the world, and it's our time to catch up. We have the capabilities, we have companies here that are willing to do this, we just need to scale it. And I think that this will be a wonderful uh, opportunity for VPPs to harness this as, as a large aggregation opportunity to really move forward the needle on making the grid the smart grid of the future. So with that, I'll pass it on. Thank you and appreciate being here today. Yeah, thanks everyone for having me. I just have one slide that we can stick on, yeah. Uh, so I'm Dana, I'm a co-founder and chief product officer at Voltus. Voltus is a distributed energy resources platform. So what we do is we aggregate and we orchestrate all of the different DER types, inclusive of EVs, which we'll talk about a lot today, but we aggregate all of the things on the left here that at the end of the day, what's the same about them is that they can provide grid services to the markets that value them. So we work a lot with wholesale markets. We also work with utilities. Uh, and what we do is we simplify and abstract away the complexity of the fact that these resources have a lot of different parameters. They have a lot of different needs. But at the end of the day, uh, we take them and we monetize them. And the incentive for working with us is financial. So we pay our customers and we monetize them through grid services in the markets. Grid services is something that I want to touch on because at the end of the day, even though EVs might look and feel like a very, very new thing on the grid, what they provide is the same thing that we've been working with for a very long time. So they provide energy, they provide capacity, they provide ancillary services. Um, what's different about them is that they're coming in extremely high volume. So for the first time, we're seeing load growth in parts of the country that we've never seen before. Uh, and that's adding to this kind of sense that there's this EV revolution that's coming and it's gonna break everything. But the way I see it is it's a tremendous opportunity because they're coming in volume and they are extremely flexible. So the volume and the variability, I think is what's different about EVs when you put them in this picture. Um, but there's actually a lot of strength in that volume and variability when it comes to reliability, which is something we all care about. So when you take a whole bunch of things and you aggregate them together, you actually create a much more reliable whole. I really liked the Beatles analogy earlier, by the way. That was the first time I'd heard that. Um, another analogy when we talk about uh, what we do is Airbnb, because the other thing that's different when you talk about distributed energy resources is that they have a separate primary use case from perhaps providing grid services. No one goes out and says, hey, I'm going to buy a Nissan Leaf or a Tesla. and like want to provide good services to MISO, right? Like that's definitely not why you buy a car. Um, however, your car is plugged in, I don't know, 10, 12 hours of the day, charging a couple of those, and it's an underutilized asset. So we have these existing already deployed, but not necessarily connected to the markets assets that the, so the Airbnb analogy there is, hey guys, like let's create a platform where we can make better use of these underutilized assets and it's reliable and it's extremely cost effective. Uh, so with that, I think um, I had one other point I really wanted to make. I'm sure I'll come back to it, but uh, yeah. So thank you for having me. Hi everybody, my name is Lydia Krafta. I'm the Director of Clean Energy Transportation at Pacific Gas and Electric, which is a utility in Northern California. And I'm gonna to apologize to Anne and all of you right now because I have some slides that have like animations. So there might have to be some double clicks here. So I invite you on an exciting adventure through some pg and &E <laughs> grid data. Um, but before we jump into that, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context as to um, what electrification looks like on our grid today. So just in December, we crossed 500,000 EVs sold in our territory, which is pretty awesome. That's about 40% of all the EVs sold in California. And that's approximately like one in six electric vehicles in the United States. So we're already seeing, I would say like a pretty sizable acceleration of electrification of vehicles in our service territory. 
our goal by 2030 is to uh, build our grid to enable 3 million electric vehicles to connect to the grid, which would put us generally on track to, in our service territory, reach the state's goal, California's state goal of 100% new EV sales by 2035. And of those 3 million EVs that will be connected to our grid, we're like all in on vehicle grid integration. Our goal is to enable 2 million of those to participate in vehicle grid integration applications. And so that's anything from vehicles participating in time of use rates and just simply shifting their load based on price signals all the way to bi-directional charging. We're doing some tests on vehicle to home as well as vehicle to grid. Um, and so uh, why do we wanna do that? Now here comes the fun animation part. So um, the slide that we have up right here is real actual data from PG&E's uh, system in 2020. And what you're seeing is uh, actual data January through December uh, are load. Our, and what you see right there in the kind of top line is our 2020 peak. And so that was summer 2020. I think we had like several heat related issues on the grid and we're building our grid every day to serve that one single peak. And so our CEO likes to say, if this was a factory, you would look at that and say like, you're fired. That utilization is very, very poor, right? Because if you look at the average load, that's that kind of uh, black line on the bottom, the difference between the average load and the peak load is pretty substantial and 364 days out of the year, from at a system level, it's not necessarily looking at a local level, we have a lot of capacity on our grid and a lot of opportunity if we have flexible resources to use that available capacity. All right, let's see what happens if you click. Okay, 2020 average popped on. All right, we can go one more. Okay, so what does this look like in the future? So right now in our territory, EVs make up 1% of our peak load approximately. By 2040, we anticipate that that will go up to about 31% of our peak load. So a substantial increase in EVs and their impact on the grid. So what you're looking at now is kind of our forecast. You can see on the, the yellow lines there, what. 2020 look like what we just looked at. And then the blue lines are what we're forecasting in 2040. Uh, I think you can probably click one more time. There's some like random words that like to pop in here. Perfect. Um, so we have our summer peak continues and then we also add a new winter peak due to building electrification. But still, if you look at that, we're still building the grid for what, three times a year in that scenario. And we still have plenty of flexibility. So today we have 500,000 EVs sold in our territory. If you assume every single one of those EVs had a 10 kilowatt bi-directional charger. Just today, we have five gigawatts of load but available to us to leverage, to help manage the grid, right? And so I think if you click one more time, or maybe twice, yeah. Um, if we're able to leverage that, right, we can bring down that peak while also bringing up the average, just like wildly improving the utilization on our grid and theoretically reducing costs to all of our customers. So um, that's why we're really excited about vehicle grid integration. Um, we've been working on several pilot projects, both looking at bi-directional charging as well as managed charging with a Foreman weave grid, which I'm sure he'll uh, hop into as uh, he did, gives his introduction. Um, and I'll do one more slide to finalize this with our wild adventure through PG&E data. Um, so overall, really what we're looking at is we're trying to leverage what we call the triple value stack um, of uh, emissions, reliability, and resiliency benefits from electric vehicles. So we have several different use cases that we're exploring, and we're really excited to find ways to leverage electric vehicles to bring down costs, uh, like basically to decarbonize society at the or the economy at the lowest societal cost. So we're really excited about that. Lydia killed it. That was an excellent summary of four slides. I'm not sure if I'm going to do my four slides as quickly, but let's try it. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for having uh, us here. Delighted to be here. Um, I was promised a pretty packed audience, and I, it's not. We're not kidding around. So I like thinking about century-long time frames. Right? We're in one. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to your once-in-a-century moment. Once in a century, because in 1916, that was the last time that Henry Ford and Thomas Edison went camping together. That was a pretty incredible moment. That was the last time these two industries came together and said, wouldn't it be cool if we built a bunch of cars that ran off of your grid? So in my apartment, I actually have a map of Chicago from 1916 with charging stations that show you where all the charging stations were in 1916. And kind of tragic that we're not, we're not doing that right now, or maybe we are. And so I looked at this opportunity, my co-founder, our team here at WeaveGrid looked at this opportunity and said, wow, there are millions of DERs already out there. There's already so much going on. But for the first time, 
280 million cars have an opportunity to go all electric. By the way, the electric grid wasn't designed for 280 million cars and then buses and trucks and everything else. But what if we could bring them together in an efficient manner? And also, what if we could do so where we take advantage of the fact that both of these industries are going through S-curves of their own, one from IC to EV, but also the other one from centralized fossil to more and more clean energy. And I think looking at that opportunities, we realized the missing link between those two industries obviously comes back to the customer. I heard some really great conversations earlier about enrollments and this and that. And those are, those are really good questions because I think those are questions that stem from experiences and, and legacy challenges, frankly, that come when customers don't think about the device day in, day out. I think about my car every day. It's what gets me to work. It's what allows somebody to pick up their kids from school. It's what was on the Super Bowl. How many connected smart thermostats have Super Bowl ads? None. Sorry, that's friends, sorry. We love you. But if we move to the next slide, the thing that actually keeps me up at night and hopefully keeps a lot of y'all up at night, if we can click through, I also have animations, I apologize. I just took inspiration from Lydia. Um, that's it. When you think about where all the EVs are showing up and the impact that they're creating, while we can of course talk about the am amazing things that EVs will do in balancing renewables, while we can talk about the peak load at the natural gas peak or power plant level, the challenge that I see living in the Bay Area is that in the city of Palo Alto, which thankfully is not a pg and &E utility, so we can, uh, we, can, we can skip that one. If you want to get a new electric vehicle today and install a charger, it takes six months to get interconnected. Not for bi-directionality, for single directional, installing a charger in your home. Because the, tr the transformer down the street from where I started this company does not have the capacity to do so. It's actually a nuts and bolts problem that's really boring and most people don't wanna think about it, but it's actually the thing that is going to become a bottleneck to us electrifying 280 million vehicles. 280 million vehicles is double, more than double the number of households in this country. So when we now think about the opportunity that 280 million vehicles provide at a bi-directionality level, it's unbelievable. We are reimagining the grid today. We are talking about a completely new paradigm where the cost is no longer going to be set by the marginal peaking power plant. It's going to be set by our ability to take advantage of the radial topology designed by Edison and Insull and that we're still living with today. And so when I think about the opportunity that VPPs have, if we go to the next slide, I kind of think about it in this, this like three phase diagram. Excuse me, that was a pun intended. Um, so. Let's look at the first one, right? The first one, and I'm citing my former employer, the Boston Consulting Group on all this, so by no means am I claiming these are my numbers. The first one is saying, what if we did nothing? What if we just let EVs happen? And guess what? People need cars, so we're gonna let them drive their cars because that freedom is enriched in the red, white, and blue of our flag. But also, as they drive their cars and they charge their cars, there's an impact on the grid. Whoever said it earlier said it rightly. Nothing's gonna, we're not gonna fail. But at the same time, there will be cost implications. There will be rate pressure implications. So let's quantify that a little bit. So they did. They did a really good job. They quantified it. Came out to about six thousand something dollars per car. Great. What if we created a VPP that went after just the generation and transmission side, the side of the of the grid that we're all very familiar with, that ISOs and RTOs are incredibly effective at sort of bringing together stakeholders, rationalizing out the costs. Good. We knocked it down a bunch. Oh wait, that's 7%. Let's try and do that optimization and let's try and do that in a much more effective way to solve for that localized problem. Those hundreds and thousands and millions of transformers, feeders, substations, conductors, everything that's actually making up the real physical grid that enables large scale bi-directionality, that enables reliability, that enables cost-effective delivery of electricity. And that's where the opportunity really lies and that's where we need to move the VPP construct towards because today we still don't really have that opportunity. And so what we do at WeaveGrid, if we can click one more, it, oh wait, that's just our logo. <laughs> what we do at WeaveGrid is bring that into reality. And one of the partners we've had, our wonderful friends here at PG&E, um, 
to give you an example, the thousands and thousands of drivers on our platform are participating in multiple of those VGI value streams. Some of those are as simple as rates. Lydia talks about this really well. One of the simplest ways to activate vehicle grid integration is through rates. I'm a huge fan of rates. I think rates do wonders in particularly removing the generation and transmission side of the challenge and enabling that value creation. I think when you get into more active managed charging though, and really when we're thinking about highly dynamic active managed charging, and remember, I really don't wanna think about the managed charging in the background because I gotta go to the grocery store and I gotta pick up my kids and I gotta go to the work. I really need it to be working seamlessly in the background. That's what we're trying to enable. But that active managed charging depends on both time and location. And I think this is one of the things is like, we've been encompassed in a world of really trying to match price signals across time or supply and demand across time. And I think that's totally right. That was what was necessary. But now location matters much more and it matters more than just the, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of locational transmission node at Kaiso or PJM, it matters down to that neighborhood. And in order to do that, you've got to have a platform that can scale, that can orchestrate, that can enable that, and can also really importantly enable what I think Lon was speaking about earlier, which is how do you enable that customer participation extremely effectively and make sure that this is something that customers want to participate in and that they see this as a part of owning their, uh, owning their vehicle. It's not something that I'm slapping on top. It's something that is part and parcel of me owning my vehicle. And that at one day when I buy an electric car, I recognize that the vehicle will provide value to the grid, both in terms of the electrons and when it uses those electrons, but also when it sends electrons back to the grid. And that's what we're trying to do over here. So once again, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. And yeah. Thank you. Um, would each of you discuss a little more about the tactical steps needed to leverage the increase in EV adoption and optimizing virtual power plants? Can we start? Sure. All right. Permission to speak freely? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the number one thing right now for us that's getting in the way is policy. It's not technology. Mm. Uh, as an example, we have over 4,000 homes in your state of Illinois that are currently awaiting becoming a VPP in MISO. But to Jigger's earlier point, apparently now we need wet ink from every single individual homeowner. There's countless examples like that where it's not actually the technology that gets in the way. It's the need to really like expand the thinking on the regulatory side and on the policy side to move us into uh, the future, the world that we've all just described, right? Like it's coming. There's a statistic I read, uh, depending on, you know, which of the growth curves you believe on EVs, by 2030, there will be more EV capacity in all of our homes than there is centralized power plant capacity. And so it's happening, and these are assets that we need to utilize. And I really just want to make sure that we don't overcomplicate on the regulatory and policy side. So things like requesting real-time telemetry from every single home, it's just not cost-effective and it's not necessary. Contract Inc. from every single home, let's leave that to the T's and C's of the thermostat providers. So it's really things like that that we're seeing in terms of the barriers. Um, we manage over four gigawatts right now of DERs across our platform and 60 plus different markets and programs. And so the other thing is that, yeah, this stuff's really, really complicated, but I think you can leave it to the tech companies to sort out that complexity. And as long as we're providing clear market access points, this is what energy looks like. This is what capacity looks like. You guys figure out the complexities of the EVs. You guys figure out what needs to happen. And we're kind of gonna let that be your side of the equation. And we're going to provide the financial incentives and the value and not overcomplicate market access. I think we'll really, really see a lot of um, improvement. Uh, and if I have one final wish, it would be that the states uh, allow aggregators to participate. There are many, many, many states that still just simply ban their participation. Yes, Can I, yeah. um, I agree. Market access is a, is a big problem. And, um, and, when I, and what I'm hearing from folks who are sort of naysayers um, and push back on helping develop that market access, the response is, 
are people really going to let their cars be used for this? Is this is this really going to happen? Um, if you get paid, yeah, yeah they will, they totally will. <laughs> and and I think what people are forgetting are, are is the use case doesn't have to be that complicated. You know, cars are parked ninety five percent of the time. When you, the average driver from home to work drives round trip twenty to forty miles, do you think they have extra capacity? Yeah. They do. And the other thing people forget about is there's this opportunity to leverage these vehicles to maximize charging with green electrons, electrons that come from renewables. Because during that 95% of the time that they're parked, if they're parked at work during the day, they're parked during the time that solar is abundant. So you can imagine someone's driving to work, they park their car, and it's charging with green electrons that might have been otherwise curtailed. And then they drive home and discharge between 4 and 9 p.m. when peaker plants would have otherwise been triggered. So now we're offsetting those peaker plants. So it, the use case isn't that complicated. And there are more use cases, but, it, but that's a big one. That's a powerful one. That alone should incentivize us, incentivize us to want to develop market access. And so that's often my response. Um, and then people just roll their eyes. <laughs> so, so, I mean, do you believe it? I, I, Sounds pretty simple to me. And, and then at the end of the day, people say, well, will that hurt my car? There are differences in electrochemistry, but for the most part, it's no more than just adding miles to your car. So if you're compensated appropriately, you'll afford a new battery, no problem. You'll be in the black. Um, and there are some numbers that have been run to show this. And, and then I, I think people will show up. The market just needs to be there. I didn't see any eye rolling. Everyone okay. would definitely agree. All right. Lydia or Good Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I thought one of the other crazily animated slides that I didn't include in our <laughs> intro was kind of that like uh, intraday load shifting, right? And I think that's when we say EVs can help us decarbonize society at the, or the economy at the lowest societal cost. Like that's what we're talking about, not having to add additional gas peaker plants, but leveraging the massive amount of generation that we'll have on our grid. I think the, like, the very tactical thing that we're working on is really trying to understand the business model. So right now we've got 100,000 customers on EV time of use rates. We've got about 4,000 customers in our managed charging pilot with WeaveGrid, and we've got six customers participating in vehicle to home pilots in our service territory. Our goal is to get to 2 million uh, customers participating in VGI applications. So we have a long way to go. I think what we're trying to understand is what, like across all these different use cases, what is the value that EVs can provide? What is the cost to customers for participating in these use cases? I think on the more like V2X side, right now what we're seeing is it's pretty costly. I think we can drive that down, but we're still really trying to get an understanding of that cost benefit. And then the last piece I think really is the, um, the customer willingness, right? To participate in these, these different pilots because understanding like what is the compensation mechanism that we need to provide to them that will entice them to participate in this and let us leverage their vehicles for uh, these various different use cases I think really helps us then better understand what is the business model that we need to put forth so that we can work with the weed grids of the world the automakers of the world and continue to provide value to the customer as well as the grid right like figuring out what's the pie and then how do we share it adequately amongst everybody so that we can most efficiently scale that scale this yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll build off of all of these points, the benefit of being the last person, I guess, in the row, uh, which is there is, I was just taking a few notes. So we have to start first and foremost with the customer. The customer is now has a relationship with their utility for the first time as their primary fueling provider, right? That is, that is a known fact because 80% of charging today happens at home. Even if all 280 million vehicles went electric, still about 60% of charging will happen at home across all of them. Which means that suddenly you now have a relationship with your utility in a way that I used to think about Exxon and Shell gas stations, and now I literally don't. And so that's a very, very different paradigm. Also, I have a relationship with my automaker, somebody who has not been talked about as much. And automakers also, and we partner with automakers, automakers are actively thinking about these questions. And they're not just thinking about them as a, oh, how do I participate in a market? They're saying, hold on a second. And I literally had a conversation today about this with one of the largest automakers in the world. They said, I have to put in a five-year design plan in my vehicle architecture to make some of the decisions that you're talking about happen. 
right, to, to make some of these, these properties happen. And it's not a complicated question. It's just a, oh, okay, how do we manage it to this level of fidelity to participate in this kind of service so that it can make this much more value for the customer? Exactly to the points we heard earlier, I mean, we have the data, cars on average in the tens, and thousands, tens of thousands of drivers and cars we have in our fleet, cars are sitting in their garage for 12 hours. They are charging between one and a half to two hours. That is real world data that I have from the fleet that we manage. We've got programs where we are matching excess renewable generation to that charging. We're making sure that all those extra, you know, wind electrons that would otherwise be curtailed out in the Midwest, we're sending them to the vehicles. So we're, we're doing those things. I think the big thing goes back to Lydia's point, which is how do we justify the business case? Because this aggregation can exist, does exist. We have them already live. But if we are avoiding, back to the slide earlier, if we're avoiding significant amounts of, of overbuild, perhaps, of distribution assets, even some transmission assets, is there a world in which we can, we can leverage that? I mean, and look, we're going to need to keep building. There is no doubt. There is no way that we can enable all these vehicles to go electric. But can we be using this as another tool in the toolkit to ensure that utilities can be fairly compensated for using technologies like ours and also building out their, their T and D assets. Um, and if we are avoiding certain builds, then, you know, can the utilities be recovering costs on that? Because to Lydia's point, the drivers that we have enrolled in our pilot are the ones that we could enroll, we could provide incentive to. And also to be clear, it's not massive incentive. This is another thing that I think is like, it's, it's a precursor and a myth from yesteryear that uh, if I have to motivate someone, it's such a pain to them, I don't have to pay them obscene amounts of money. We're paying people a hundred bucks and they're participating. And another data point off the drivers that are enrolled that are receiving an incentive, 90, almost 90% 90 are allowing us to actively manage their vehicle versus opting into a behavioral managed charging program. That's a huge difference, right? And all we have to give them is an extra $50. Okay. So you can kind of see like how much, how much people are willing to be moved a very small amounts of money. Can I build on that for a second? Sure. And I think that one of the things we see is um, we work a lot with wholesale markets and the play between wholesale and retail is one that I actually think people can embrace more in terms of wholesale markets are providing a financial incentive that exists today. So, and the utility can, can also think about the benefit of that. So if we can leverage the wholesale market incentives to help fund and create the economics for the program, a lot of, sort of magical things start to happen. So for example, in the Southwest Power Pool, we have a 100 plus megawatt VPP that right now is made up of mostly small CNI all the way up to large uh, industrial facilities. Um, but if you think about, I'll just use some basic unit economics, it's $100,000 per megawatt per year if you're 24 seven. So that's 100 bucks a kilowatt, which is roughly someone's smart thermostat. Uh, so $100 a year to participate in a program, as long as you have that wholesale market access, it balances wind, it's dispatched every other day or so, it can also play with the local retail programs. And so in terms of creating that incentive for somebody to sign up for it, you can work with aggregators, you can leverage wholesale market programs and not be afraid to kind of layer in with the retail that those two things can coexist. We often see this like real reticence that wholesale and retail are like mutually exclusive and it really just doesn't uh, need to be that way if you can make sure that they're not happening at the same point in time. But they can happen over the course of the year and really be co-optimized together and it's just another source of funding that exists today. Um, so. To give on the wholesale, yeah. uh, given Order 2222's implementation, um, other thoughts on the state of RTO ISOs and what needs to be done there. I'm, ha I'm happy to take that one if you guys want. Uh, so first, can we do it faster than 2030 that I'm seeing out there? Like it would be really great. Like 2222 came out two and a half years ago. Uh, it would be really nice. Date, Dana. Yep. That's the implementation date, 2222. We have to wait until 2022. Oh my 22. God, I know. No one yeah. told me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no you didn't know that, right? It was actually jokingly that was the date. for human longevity. In right, the meantime, first. So. Okay, uh, yeah. So just, I think, like, you know, we talk at the loan program office, I always hear it's like deploy, deploy, deploy. So, like, the one thing that will kill deploy, deploy, deploy is like letting perfect be the enemy of extremely good. 
So perfect is the enemy of deploy, deploy, deploy. So perfect is we need telemetry on every single thing. We need wet ink on every single thing. There are statistical sampling methods we can use when you talk about small CNI and residential customers that we've been doing for, I've been doing this 15 years and I've seen utilities run very successful residential programs with AC loads for years now. So let's not reinvent that and think that every single thing needs to be perfectly metered, please. Um, because that will kill all of these programs because it makes those unit economics go away. And it has to be profitable for the consumer to do this. I have to be able to give you $100 to participate with your home. Um, but if I have to send real-time streaming telemetry at that granular level, I can no longer do that. So I think 2222, really, really, please don't let perfect be the enemy of deploy, um, especially when it comes to those smaller sectors like this um, residential and small medium businesses and speed. I, 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 think, I do think that for 2222 is, is, is helping get people thinking about this, right, and moving forward. And, you know, and, and, and in California, they did introduce the energy load reduction, the emergency load reduction pro program that pays $2 a kilowatt for electric vehicles to participate and provide power back to the grid. So it's, you know, it, things are moving in the right direction. Um, I do think that maybe to sort of help reduce the complexity of telemetry and, and things that require that 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 wet ink um, if, if you know a, a good derms management system mm -hmm. could actually help facilitate implementation of for 2222 um, and that is something that could be done at the utility level and it, and utilities like derms systems it gives them visibility it gives them awareness it, it will actually maybe provide more comfort to transitioning into this new bi-directional grid that we want ultimately I'm going to open it up. Questions from the audience? Vehicle to grid? Okay. Yes. Oh, one there and one here. I just have a general question. How often do you talk to or engage with NERC when you're talking about providing these kinds of services? I can answer. Go ahead. You want, yeah. you want to go ahead? I'd say uh, for us, it's uh, infrequently to not very often. We're generally engaging for, for us at the um, the goals that we have right now is mostly with our public utilities commission. Um, Dana, if you want to answer that one, or I can go ahead. I'll answer very quickly. Similar answer. I think um, the NERC standards kind of propagate through to the wholesale market tariffs. And so uh, as long as we're compliant with those, we end up not working with NERC very much. I actually think NERC is going to have an important role to play, particularly, well, there's many different agencies here, but I'll use NERC as, as the placeholder when it comes to cyber. And vehicles are actually a very, very large load, but they are also very intelligent computers. And so increasingly with cyber threat, there is, I think there are attack vectors that we think a lot about, which is how do you protect? Um, and NERC obviously has a lot of standards and so forth on the cyber side. So we think about it from that side, less from maybe the actual reliability council you know, aspect. So I wasn't necessarily going to ask if you engage with them and talk to them. I was thinking about it in terms of, even in the last panel, that the idea is that these assets provide services that do away with the need for speakers, but speakers provide reliability services like mm -hmm. operating. That's over half our portfolio today. So today we can provide operating reserves and ancillary services from these assets. And well, I one quick last question. Um, what are the top five states where you're expecting implementation? Um, where are you expecting VPPs to take off in the next five years? Top five states in the next five years. Uh, utility. I'll just say this top, this top state that we're looking at is California. <laughs> I would probably put New York as number two. I see potential there. I see a lot of rumblings and things moving in the right direction. Illinois. 
Yeah. Illinois I'm not just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Illinois, MISO has got a capacity shortage. Uh, the businesses and, and residents there are extremely engaged. Prices are there. PJM might be, a, you know, PJM jurisdiction, PJM. I think is another good yeah. one. Yeah, I was going to say Maryland. On top of all of these, I feel like Maryland's been a really good one. There's been a lot of really innovative stuff going on out here. I wanted to also give the home crowd something to cheer for. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Um, how much does it cost an average home to get plugged in to a bi-directional smart EV charging oh. meter? <laughs> I'm gonna let, let you take this one. Brace yourself. Maybe everyone just cover your ears. Well, all right. So we've had we've deployed six, and realistically, <laughs> three we've done cost estimates for, but it's a, right now around like fifteen thousand dollars, and that's because we have to island the home, typically upgrade the panel, and do a lot of work. To get to two million, we have to bring that down substantially. But right now, let's say units one, two, and three are pretty expensive. I can say that a bi-directional charger can average around four thousand dollars, and then the installation from the homeowners like. To buy a higher electrician could be about a thousand dollars. Yeah, I think I think there's also I love the question being centered around homes. I will say fleets are a very different use case, mm -hmm. and I think with fleets the cost is higher per unit, but also the recovery of that cost is much much higher, is much faster too. So I think I think it's funny we've actually focused so much on resi, even though I think Dana in particular y'all handle a lot more fleets than we do, and and I think like. Residential, absolutely, we should be talking about a lot of these questions with fleets, like the economics, the way they measure ROI, all of those things start to, to start to look very different. But also, uh, as somebody once told me, you're trying to put the amount of power required for the Empire State Building in a parking lot for some fleets. So that, that starts to get hairy pretty quickly, too. That's a good point. Can I, I also want to answer this question with a big, I don't know the answer to that. But the reason I don't know, in addition to not being the expert, that I don't think it matters as much as we think. Like we've talked, we focus a lot on bi-directional and V to G, but like 95 plus percent of the opportunity right now is just managed charging and V one G. Um, let's not get wrapped up on V two G. We can cross that bridge in a hot sec when we get there. Like we're not good at V one G yet, and that's you don't need the fifteen thousand dollars to do that. So the reason I don't know the answer is I don't think it's as important as we all fixate on when we talk about V to G. I will agree with yeah, that you one. Yeah, you Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Real quick. Well, I, I guess with V1G, I, the difference between V1G and V2G is the capacity. Totally. It's the power of the capacity. It's in the case of V1G, we're still going to be putting in that stationary storage and, and spending that high upfront capital cost. You're not going to maximize the use of the renewables. Those things could still get curtailed because you're not storing them and using them at later times during the day. So there, there. The there is an opportunity cost, and uh, and that needs to be quantified better. But I, the capacity you're talking about losing and giving that up, and 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 this is an infrastructure investment where that we're about to make some huge infrastructure investments. Why are we going to be? We could be making investments in technology that will not have to be replaced in two or three years and i think particularly a v2x also has non-monetary value in the sense of resiliency that people aren't going to quantify exactly but like it is, is obviously super valuable to have a backup so yeah, yeah. well vehicle to problem. home doesn't have to be like net injection to the yeah. grid either so there's like all these use cases that can happen i think we're I, i'm agreeing with saying like there's steps we can take at least so there's steps. obviously this could go on another hour. <laughs> um, but I want to thank our panelists, thank Rima, you. Dana, Lydia, and Arpur.
We're going to get started. If folks want to find their seats, Folks want to get seated, we're going to get started. All right, I'm going to start talking. Yep. Welcome back. Welcome back and uh, see if you can corral some of the folks out in the hall there. Um, I'm Ann McCabe, Commissioner at the Illinois Commerce Commission. I'm in my second term, separated by five years. And uh, I will say that the opportunity to participate in this event has uh, been a developmental opportunity. I first heard the term virtual power plant a few years ago from a colleague at RAP, Carl Linville which is not surprising as he's in California and a former Nevada commissioner. I'd say many of us are, uh, as, as far as regulators and commissioners go, um, we are learning about virtual power plants, but they are gonna be increasingly essential to enable a stable, flexible, and decarbonized grid at a lower cost. The next few years are a critical window for virtual power plant market development. Coordination and collaboration over this time can set the VPP market on a path to delivering long-term benefits, advance key grid objectives, as well as state policy goals, such as resilience, affordability, electrification, decarbonization, health and equity, and consumer empowerment. One of the challenges for regulators is how to shape policy and regulation and enable virtual power plants and put virtual power plants on a level playing field with traditional grid investment. In a few minutes, I'll, I'll uh, also address two big issues, interconnection and data access. But I just want to illustrate two examples of virtual power plants. You've heard some previously this afternoon. One is bring your own device or bring your own storage. Example of that is Green Mountain Power, which subsidizes residential solar in exchange for the owners being on call, and they have significant amount of megawatts they can call on when needed. This arrangement is less expensive than building generation or storage themselves. A more complicated example would be aggregating resources behind the meter for non-wires alternatives, congestion relief, or other needs. We need to think through barriers as well as opportunities. Barriers include wholesale market value, retail offerings, and consumer awareness and education. Wholesale market barriers include Order 2222 implementation and the timing thereof. Uh, I, in my conversations in recent weeks, I've heard several people say that the virtual power plants are going to be in place well in advance of order 2222 in some regions. And uh, someone else mentioned that almost every RTO in the last year has issued a call to conserve. Another reason virtual power plants and the flexibility they provide can provide a valuable resource. Uh, interconnection standards, processes and aggregation reviews will be crucial. A number of states have updated their interconnection rules, including Minnesota and a few years ago, Illinois updated ours last year. We're also gonna resurrect our interconnection working group. Um, other states may wanna think about doing the same thing. Uh, another issue is utilities versus third party aggregation or both. Uh, 
how to dispatch and when. And on the data access front, data and data access are very important. Virtual power plants will require flexible data rules or infrastructure that allow other resources to participate. The least cost virtual power plant will rely on flexible demand. We need to be able to validate data. As technologies are added to the grid, we'll need base level software functionality and rate designs to build a system that can be monitored in real time and be predictable. As we discussed in a prior panel, another way to do that is through performance-based regulation and metrics. And there are a number of virtual power plant partnerships uh, already created and in the works. Compensation is another issue. Pay to perform is straightforward. It's working. It can be cheaper than a non-wire alternative. Wholesale markets, on the other hand, will require more stringent measurement and verification and smaller interval data availability. As I said, I'm kind of beginning my virtual power plant journey, and I want to reference another former commissioner, um, Arkansas Chair Ted Thomas, who has a lot of thoughts about this issue. And he stressed the need for large aggregation of DERs to be technology neutral and rigorously measured, the importance of total system benefits to avoid to avoid siloed programs, and the need for a common compensation system based on what is delivered to the grid and when it is delivered to enable participation by energy efficiency, demand response, vehicle to grid, rooftop solar, and other resources. So state re regulators have a role to play in shaping policy and regulation to facilitate virtual power plants, load shaping and shifting, avoiding investment and thereby lowering costs, and aggregating DERs of all kinds. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. Oh, yeah, questions. If not, we can get panel back on schedule. Oh, yes. Hello. Um, if there are any commissioners um, still in this room, I would love to hear the, um, you know, what it takes, what it takes to get VPPs in your state, and how could we, as an industry, make you all feel comfortable that these, this is a good idea, um, and how could we make you all sign off on it? Okay. I'll start, and I know Minnesota Commissioner Matt Sugar is here, and are there any other commissioners? Okay. Um, I will just say, uh, we had major energy legislation pass in September 2021, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, and it is spawning all kinds of stuff, uh, beneficial electrification, multi-year grid plans, storage reports, performance metrics, and many of these are open dockets, so I can't talk about them, but I think they're all going to lead to a way to help us meet our state goals on decarbonization, uh, affordability, flexibility, so, um, Commissioner Sugar, you want to add on? He's, he's on the next panel, too, so you may as well come up. I'll, I'll try to address some of that on the panel, okay. if that's all right. Thanks. All right, we're good. Next panel, come on up. It's good to meet you. Can everybody hear us or hear me? Great. 
Well, welcome uh, to the third uh, session of the workshop, and we're so excited to have you here. Um, first, just quick introductions. Uh, my name is Yoke Potts. I'm the Director of Regulatory and Business Innovation at SEPA, um, and uh, just joined prior to that role. I spent 18 years at MISO working in various roles in reliability and markets of operations from engineering to leadership. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, help moderate this panel. Um, I first learned about VPPs about seven years ago, but there just wasn't really a lot of appetite. And so this is really exciting to see a, full, a, a room full of folks who are really interested in, in learning more about VPPs and how, um, how we can really get this moving. So, so to introduce the panels, the amazing panel that we have, first we have uh, Commissioner Matt Sugar um, from the Minnesota Public Utility Commission. Um, then we have Pearl Donat, um, Donny uh, Doctor Doctor Vaughn, would you would you like me to I say that? Like no, DV, DV, Doctor DV. Doctor DV. Can I say that? Everybody. Oh, that's great. Let's yeah. do that, Doctor DV. Um, <laughs> so she's from Exxon, and um, we have Kevin Bren, uh, who is from uh, Rocky Mountain Power Institute, and then we also have uh, Seth Frater Thompson, who is from Energy Hub. So I would like to uh, give them an opportunity to properly uh, introduce themselves and, um, and talk a little bit more about what you guys are working on. So can we start off with perhaps, um, Commissioner, do you want to start first or? Uh, sure, I, I could go first. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for including me in this um, fascinating uh, afternoon program. It's, it's been super interesting to me, uh, really important, critical topic uh, for all of us. Uh, I'm Matt Sugar, Commissioner, uh, Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, and I just want to briefly set a little context and talk a little bit about what we're doing in Minnesota. Um, like much of the country, we're undergoing a pretty significant grid transformation. You know, just 15 years ago, we were two thirds coal. Um, we're we're down to 30% um, renewables, 20% in falling coal, 20% gas, 20% nuclear. But we'll be, um, our largest utility will be 80% decarbonized by 2030. All of our utilities will be fully decarbonized by 2040. Um, so we're really having a pretty, as, as is happening in much of the country, a pretty significant change in the system uh, from large centralized to decentralized, uh, from, um, and, and also a shift towards uh, variable renewable generation. So as this system transitions, uh, we understand the critical importance of flexibility, the increasing importance of flexibility, um, and that the need to um, engage, identify and engage flexibility throughout the entire system. As I look at this as, a, as an economic regulator and look at this, this transition challenge, um, you know, it's not just, of course, um, capacity and energy, but it's uh, it's important reliability services. We were talking about NERC in one of the last panels uh, and flexibility is a key part of that. And I know as a regulator that our customers can't afford to build our way out of this problem. We can't build um, all supply side generation and afford it to provide this flexibility. So we've got to get into the distribution systems and we've got to get into flexibility. Uh, we've been thinking about that in, in Minnesota for a while. We um, initiated a grid modernization program, um, started, started working on it in 2016, really got it kind of engaged in, in 2017, 2018. But while we want to make sure that we're remaining focused on safety, security, reliability of the system, we're really looking in, in our grid modernization to get um, greater customer engagement and empowerment and options. Um, and we're looking at um, efficient, cost-effective, accessible grid platforms and looking at ensuring that we optimize the use of our assets. So um, we're seeing a lot of activity in the distribution system and we're working to um, both support and encourage that, but prepare more for that. So um, as uh, Commissioner McCabe mentioned earlier, we have in Minnesota updated our interconnection standards. Uh, the new 1547 2018 standards that really look at the capability of advanced inverters and those capabilities that they'll bring to this discussion we'll have today and and kind of working to reshape how we can process interconnection queues and how we can process multiple new technologies getting on the system um, as quickly and as efficiently as possible we've implemented integrated distribution system planning um, 
and bring light of day into an area that's long been really siloed off uh, in all the utilities to get forward looking transparent uh, planning processes where we're looking on a regular basis two year cycles with our utilities forecasts of DERs um, uh, forecasts of uh, these various technologies and things that are happening in, in the system in addition to loads and really looking at where are the stresses and strains and what do, what do we need to, um, to plan for. There's a host of new technologies coming around that, advanced metering, advanced distribution management system. I heard DERMS mentioned earlier on a panel, looking at making sure our utilities are fitting those into the planning, uh, their, their planning uh, paradigm. We're doing a lot of work with electrification of electric vehicles. And in our initial investigation, which dates back five years ago in electric vehicles in Minnesota, uh, we, we had a finding from the commission that electrification of transportation was in the public interest and that the utilities had a critical role to play in that. But we identified right up front that how we integrate them is really the key to whether we recognize whether we whether we realize the, the public interest benefits that are there. That is, we've got to be thinking about uh, smart charging and advanced charging uh, from the get go and from the start. Uh, in Minnesota, we've had uh, demand response for years, and it's really been um, uh, largely focused on traditional demand response, simply clipping off peaks, simply shaving peak loads. Our largest utility has the ability um, um, to, to, um, to, sh to shape and to change about 10% of their peak load. It's about a gigawatt, about 1,000 megawatts of demand response, but again, it's largely the traditional demand response and peak shaving and we're really working with our utilities to get that more into i, th I think i heard Mc commissioner mccabe mention in her remarks but the the, the, sh the shaping and shifting and uh, even the shimming shimmering if you will um in addition to sh shedding right so the, i think it's the lbnl language around how do we get advanced dr going that's a that's a place of transformation for us so we recognize the importance of flexibility um, and again we're a vertically integrated retail rate regulated utility so we're largely working to date with our utilities and the folks that they bring in to partner with that but when we look at the challenge before us in minnesota we understand that we've got to accelerate this and we're really looking for solutions we're really looking for um, creative approaches that fit the um, the regulatory paradigm that we're in and I think that's important as we're talking about regulators and regulatory paradigms that it is different in different parts of the country and these approaches will need to be sh uh, uh, shaped and adapted to that but um, I would just say we're focused on solutions and I I look forward to uh, uh, questions maybe digging in a little deeper on some of those pieces that are going on thanks yes, definitely um, Kevin, would you mind talking to us a little bit more about what you're working on here? Let me get the slides up. Oh, there we go. Sure. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. Kevin Bram. I'm a manager at RMI, where I lead up our work on virtual power plant partnership. Uh, so many of you have heard of that, about this. Thank you, Jigger. <laughs> Wherever you are for preaching the gospel when it comes to virtual power plants and, and the work we're doing for VP3. So I'll talk to you just a little bit about what we're doing with VP3, who we are, what we do, why we're doing it. Um, and then I want to share with you a few of the takeaways from what we're hearing from our members um, when it comes to integrated approaches uh, to take advantage of the VPP opportunity. Um, so first, I, I do want to recognize our, our members. So VP3 is a uh, member-funded, member-driven organization that exists within RMI. Uh, our members are technology and service providers in the energy and DER space. Um, you can see them on the slide, but I'll name them because we really appreciate the work they do. Ford, General Motors, Google Nest, Leap, Olivine, Ohm Connect, Span, SunPower, Sunrun, Switched in Virtual, Switched in and Virtual Peaker. Uh, NRG recently joined. We weren't able to get their logo on the slide, and there's a few other organizations, including folks in this room, that we expect to join shortly. Um, we, we do three th things as, as VP3. One is convening. Um, our members, I think sort of key is they, they really span the different technologies within uh, distributed energy resources and VPPs. 
So, you know, I think we had a panel about grid interactive efficient buildings. We had a panel about EVs. Uh, are the two organizations that really helped conceive and, and helped get this going were GM and Google Nest. So coming from the building side of things as well as the EV side of things. So it's very much in what we do. So as convening, as conveners, one of the things we do is uh, try to identify best practice, advance best practice, and sort of with our group of members, work through some of the really thorny and challenging issues. Um, I think as we sit here today, we can point to a lot of examples of best, or at the very least, improving practice. I, I struggle sometimes to point to, this is the best practice that we should do everywhere. And we've heard that we don't want to let perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think we're still trying to identify and consolidate around regulatorily, this is what we should do from a utility program. So that's one of the things we aim to do through convening. Um, on direct support, so that means um, we're really focused on state level decisions and decision makers. So that means being in dialogue with um, regulators, being in dialogue with utilities, being involved in dockets um, to help be able to represent what we're hearing from our members and provide a bit of a consolidated voice that taps into the expertise that our members bring to this. Um, and then finally, education. Um, so as we've heard time and time again, we're all learning about this topic. Oftentimes, as we are learning, we're pointing to examples. We're also sometimes, including myself, inclined to be somewhat hand wavy about this. So how can we get concrete about understanding the benefits of virtual power plants and how to access those benefits? Um, so along those lines, you can go to the next slide here. I did want to point folks to a uh, recent uh, report we put out uh, just a month ago called Virtual Power Plants, Real Benefits. It's kind of a framework paper that points to the benefits we see virtual power plants being able to provide and also points to some examples. And I, I think just to pause on this a little bit, we are my, or, you know, our 501c3 not-for-profit organization. We care about growing the VPP market because we believe VPPs can provide these benefits. And I don't think there's anybody in the room who doesn't think the power sector should be trying to access these benefits. Uh, so, so finally, I wanted to share some messages that we're hearing from our members. And this is the uh, SEPA held the line on two slides. So this is the uh, no slides, take out your pens. <laughs> these are some things that we've heard though before. I think one thing that we hear about an integrated approach is the need to advance technology neutral approaches. Um, I think to play off what I heard, I think from Juan in an earlier panel is, you know, we need to have a thousand technologies involved. We don't need a thousand programs. And I think that's one of the resonant messages we hear from folks wherever they exist within our membership. Um, the second is to allow distributed energy resources to provide multiple services. I think we've heard this. I think we need to recognize where we are, what's the next set of services, and then what's the next set of services that we'll provide five to 10 years down the line, but there's, there's a lot of them. So we need to find ways to access those. Uh, third, again, I think we've heard this, but it's optimizing the customer experience. And to introduce, you know, we, we heard before about, you know, the, the challenge of wet ink and your need to sign up via wet ink in states like Illinois. I, I think to put a term that really resonates with me is that this is friction. Uh, this is friction to the customer experience and friction becomes a cost. Yes, there's a huge opportunity when we look at sort of the total aggregated potential. And when it comes to a viable business model, if we introduce friction time and time again, just from small, you know, uh, inconveniences to the customer experience, that net value quickly disappears. So we really need to find ways to optimize the customer experience whether that's through how they're interacting with the utilities, removing inefficiencies, making sure that they're interacting with the party that is able to innovate and provide the best customer experience. Um, and, and then finally, I, I guess to put a question to this audience, how many folks here are, uh, work for utilities and are responsible for planning, resource planning? <laughs> Case in point, we need to integrate <laughs> uh, distributed energy resources and really the supply side into reliability planning and decarbonization planning. How many people work for a utility that or, or is in, live in a service territory where utility has an aggressive decarbonization goal? Everybody, right? So I think those are two pieces that we really want to make sure are included in this. Um, I think, you know, we'll get a chance to hear some questions and talk a little bit later, but I would encourage you to reach out. You can check us out at vp3.io and we'd love to talk. Thank you very much.
<clears throat> Pearl, do you want to jump in the next one? I think I slides right there for you. Absolutely. And I will try and keep this a little bit short because we are at the end of the day. And I know that happy hour is much more exciting than BPPs, <laughs> although we all love BPPs. So I think that we've all heard, I think we all agree, we are really at the edge of an exciting transformation of the electric sector. We are seeing incredibly rapid adoption of potentially grid interactive devices, especially in the transportation sector. We were having a conversation with a regional transportation provider earlier today who was telling us they were looking at adding 100 megawatts of electric buses within, oh, about the next five years. We're also expecting to have about 40 megawatts of V to G enabled so that the two, not just V1G, but V2G enabled buses in one of our service territories within the next five years. So the future is now and the future is accelerating. So we're seeing this every year. We get more and more of these grid interactive devices. What we see as a distribution utility, so I work in the small wires, and as a distribution utility, what we see is that this is a fundamental change in the way that the distribution system will operate. We are looking at the potential for significant bi-directional flows on our system, not just NEM solar, B to G, other technologies, and we're looking at how that is gonna change our system operations. And if we don't manage that well, we have concerns with safe, reliable, affordable, but if we manage it well, which is what we are all in this room aligned to do, we're looking at creating maximum value for our customers, we're looking at really creating an interactive distribution system in a way that we haven't seen before. So we've talked a lot about the side of the system, which is look at all of these great end use devices, all of the grid interactive uh, thermostats, all of the grid interactive cars, all of this that we're going to see. When we're looking at not building our way out of this transition, we're looking at, so what is it that we need on the communications front? What is it that we need for monitoring? What is it the type of technology that we need for control so that we can manage this transition and also create maximum value for our customers? At Pepco Holdings, which is the part of Exelon that I work within, we really <coughs> view this as the future, which is an integrated interactive distribution system. So I think that I was asked partially to speak about, so what does that really look like on the ground when you try to look at all of these different value sets? So if we could go to the next slide. Oh, well, one too I went, far. Yes. So we have the privilege of working with Delmarva Power, and this is a project that Delmarva Power, we've been working in our Maryland service territory as a pilot with the Maryland Commission, where we have a virtual power plant that has just been commissioned within the last couple months. So this is the Elk Neck uh, power plant, virtual power plant. It is a relatively small but incredibly mighty pilot program and it's an incredibly mighty pilot program because what we're trying to do is explore what does it take to get all of the values in the value stack so we're looking at wholesale market participation we have a partnership with pjm where we're working through their pilot uh, program process with our partner sunverge how do we operate this in the regulation d market what does that mean from an interconnection perspective. How do we think about not just doing one interconnection application, but now we have 100. What does that mean for a wholesale market participation agreement? What does that mean for how we study it? All of these issues that are coming to light as we think about aggregation and not just a single device moving, but lots of devices moving in unison in brand new ways. We're looking at providing distribution services. So actual distribution grid services, not just wholesale market, but what does it take not to build our way out of something? That means new agreements, because what when we're looking for reliability services on the wire side, that's a much higher standard. We need to be able to call that incredibly reliably. What does that mean from a legal perspective? What does that mean from a customer interaction and customer experience perspective? If it's not good for the customer, it's not going to work. So how do we work through the, and balance those needs? And then this is also something where it is in-home storage, it's behind the meter storage, that is providing backup for our customers. One of the neat things and reasons that we picked this part of our system to work in is that it's a relatively isolated part of the Del Mar service territory where there's just a single uh, feeder that's serving customers. So this is an area that has had outages where we are working on the reliability and we're looking to see, is this a viable solution? We've had great feedback from our customers so far in the program. They've been really, really happy with it. Had lots of lessons learned. And I would just give one, which is that 
I think even today we've had some discussion about, you know, there's that peak at the four to six o'clock in the summer. And so we design programs around that. And that's how we think about it. But I think even in late December here in PJM, we saw that designing programs to think about a historic summer peaking load, that's not gonna work. We need flexibility in our program design. We need to set expectations with our customers so that they aren't surprised by winter calls. We need to really think about how do we build virtual power plants? How do we think about customer experience as we go from potentially summer peaking systems to new winter peaking systems where we have peaks between six and 8 a.m. And that's not happening in 15, 20 years. That's happening today in some parts of our service territory. So that was some of the on the ground, here's what we're seeing from putting one in place and the, the perspective from, from the little wires. Thank you. Seth, did you want to talk a little bit more about what you guys are doing? Yeah, I will, I will also try to be short here. So I, I sort of anticipated that since I was going to be going last overall for the entire day, that we would have heard a lot about sort of like when this happens or if this happens or what's getting in the way of it happening. And so I just wanted to say it's happening a lot. Um, we're just one company. We have about a million DERs under management participating in utility programs today, um, running programs for about 60 utilities. Um, in aggregate, those are about 1,300 megawatts of dispatchable flexibility. I think the load under management is like three or 4,000 megawatts. So sort of not a vanity figure, an actual dispatchable um, amount of flexibility. Um, what's interesting is that, so uh, the commissioner from Arizona mentioned APS. So APS kind of, I think, outperforms most utilities in the US in that they're getting about, I think they have about 7% of their customers are participating in a DER program. Um, across the US, about 18% of homes have some DER. It could be a thermostat, could be solar on the roof. Um, of those, 15% typically participate. So if you multiply 18% times, you know, that, that range of roughly 15%, it means roughly 2 to 3% of, of homes are participating on average across the U.S. The, the highest performing utilities are in the 5 to 7% range. So that gives you the sense that 5 to 7% this early in the process is not small, right? That is, that is doing quite well, but there's an enormous amount of, of, uh, of room to grow. Um, I will say that when I look at sort of why we have been successful and where a lot of other companies in the space have struggled, um, surprisingly, the fact that we are working with utilities, I think, is the primary success factor. Utilities have a unique ability to tap into all the different value streams that are available. Uh, they can blend different value streams. And so um, I think uh, thinking about what Dana said from, um, from Voltus and thinking about the aggregator perspective. I, you know, when I set out to start the company years ago, I didn't think that I would be sort of advocating for the, you know, the utility monopoly, but it turns out that the utility monopoly is among the best positioned to remove friction from the process. Um, okay, so I said two to three percent on average of, of homes. Go to the next slide. How much flexibility do we need to get? Um, so if you look at the, the Biden administration's plan, if you decarbonize the entire electricity system, we're going to have, call it 1,500 uh, gigawatts of clean generation in the system. This is assuming you have a bunch of load growth from EVs. Um, you'll have nuclear in there, but you'll have a lot of intermittent renewables. And the reality is you just cannot do that without flexibility, right? You cannot have the inevitable intermittency without flexibility. What is flexibility? Flexibility is that ability to shift to store, to move load around. So that's everything from batteries to uh, pool pumps, to EVs, to, to everything. So that means we need 500 gigawatts, half a terawatt of flexibility on the system. But we are hearing that like, that's just, that's not, I mean, it's a big country, right? We're gonna have hundreds of millions of DERs, of EVs, of smart thermostats, of batteries. The only thing that we have to do, and those are all gonna get installed irrespective of the utilities involvement or the wholesale markets involvement. They're going to get installed because the customers want them for one reason or another. So the question is just how do you tap into them in a way that continues that growth? And then to push back hours back to, I think, what maybe David said, uh, he said, you know, the, the EE thing has just been kind of like, you know, slow and steady. I think our compound annual growth of DER participation for the last like 
eight years is like 75%. It does look like pretty hockey stickish, and it will continue to look like that. So we just got to keep doing what we're doing. Thank you. That's great. Um, I'm going to just pause and see if um, we have any commissioner questions. Um, no. All right. So then let's get to, um, I know that we've talked a lot about, or at least the earlier sessions, um, kind of lightly touched on the questions that we were about to ask. Um, but I think that you guys are such um, great experts here. So I want to make sure that we get, <laughs> you guys get a chance to speak too. So um, Pearl, maybe you can start us off. You, you mentioned one of the lessons learned from the Elk, um, Elk Neck virtual power plant. Are there other virtual um, lessons learned that you want to share as well? Yeah, so I mentioned thinking about flexibilities. We think about VPPs and moving away from it's going to happen in the summer peak, which I think is a big shift for us as an industry as we think about the electrification of so many things, transportation, homes. So shifting away and making sure that we're thinking about flexibility. We've also learned a lot. And I was listening to the last panel, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say. Because we learned a lot about cybersecurity, IT integration, communication, monitoring, and the need for all of those and how much we have to go to really make it a seamless experience. If you're going to not build your way out of something, if you're really going to use something to substitute for a wires investment. We're talking about integration with sophisticated control rooms. We found not just in this project, but with a couple others we were working on, that software that some folks were using could not integrate with our IT systems. It was a cybersecurity risk and we could not do it. So I worry about, and now think a lot more about, how do we make sure that our systems are all able to talk to each other? How do we make sure that we have a central view of monitoring on the system to make sure that we don't have unanticipated flows on the system, to make sure that we're able to manage this new movement on the system, which we expect to be pretty substantial. Great, thank you. Um, Kevin, so a little bit more on, um, you know, as we're learning how, virtual power plants can really add uh, more value to the electric system. Um, what can you share more about the third party um, service providers in advancing that adoption? Sure. So, you know, I think our members are technology and service providers, and they believe, we believe that third party service and technology providers have a critical role to play. And I think really a lot of that of all has to do with innovation, driving innovation. So it comes to innovation in the customer experience. It's innovation in really DER management and dispatch. It's innovation and in advancement in hardware. Um, we believe third-party service providers, like I said, have, have an important role to play. And also we recognize that the utility is always gonna be a critical partner. The load serving entity, in some instances, it's gonna be retail electricity partner, is always gonna be a critical partner. So there's, you know, I think, you know, with Energy Hub, there's lots of examples of what that partnership might look like, but we really be believe that the, the, the path forward, whether, you know, whether the third party service provider is directly having the customer relationship, whether the third party service provider is working through a retail electricity provider or a utility, um, there's a lot of value to be brought by finding ways to innovate and bring in third party service providers. Thank you. Um, Seth? Can you share some more example of how utilities and states are are really adopting virtual power plants? I mean, I think that you mentioned several already, but can you elaborate some more? Yeah. Um, so I, I mentioned uh, I mentioned Arizona. I think I also mentioned this sort of need to blend the different value streams. So I think what's interesting in Arizona, Arizona, you know, borders California. They have access to the energy imbalance market. It's pretty interesting to see as their VP, as, as APS's VPP program grew somewhere past 50 or 100 megawatts. Um, to Kevin's point about integration, the other other departments in the utility started to pay attention. The market trading desk started saying, "Can I do economic dispatch with this in addition to the long term system planning, the resource adequacy?" Meaning you had you've already paid for the resource. It was it already penciled and now you're getting more value out of it and it just goes directly to lowering rates. Um, so I think that's a good example. Um, I think Arizona has the potential to be a somewhat fraught um, uh, regulatory environment, but surprisingly, I think Arizona is 
very tolerant of uh, small mistakes. And the, the utilities in Arizona have done a good job of saying, we started down this path where we had this fuzzy idea of, let's see if we can do X, Y, Z with batteries. And they start doing it with batteries. And they're like, this is close, but it's not really working. Let's shut down program version one and move on to version two and not per try to pretend like version one was fully working. Um, so they, they're able to learn and iterate, which in a regulated re environment is not easy, right? So that I think that's another one where it's a good kind of partnership. Um, and then the last, getting back to the blending of, of value, um, in the Northeast, there's a program called Connected Solutions that is in uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and I think maybe also Rhode Island. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, they took what started as kind of a modern demand response program and then started turning it into sort of a load shifting program. And so you've now got thousands of behind the meter batteries that sit there and every day for the months of July and August um, for summer participants, and I forget exactly when, but also in the winter, those batteries can flex every single day. And the batteries are owned by the homeowner and the, the utility is essentially renting access to the capacity of the battery. They pledge not to use the battery going into some sort of potential storm or other disruption. Um, but the, the economic stream is predictable. And so once you start seeing people start saying, oh, there's like $200 a kilowatt available for this battery load shift program, the, the people selling batteries start incorporating that into their sales pitch. And suddenly your battery adoption rate goes way up. And now everyone's like, why wouldn't I get a battery if the utility is going to pay for half of it? Right. So you get it right and you get a really nice kind of self reinforcing loop. Thank you. Commissioner Sugar, um, are there any concerns that we want to, we want to bring attention to um, that could help utilities and regulators capture some of these benefits? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so many concerns. No. Um, <laughs> I think one of the, the key issues, I, I think that's a question, is um, I just feel like the, the, um, uh, the value of and the opportunities for load flexibility through virtual power plants or other combinations of flexible demand is not well understood in multiple dimensions. And so we talk about education, but it's really, it really is a key issue. Um, and I want to tie that back to a couple other pieces that were raised. Um, I think, you know, the point about um, looking at how aggregated DERs and load flexibility fits into the overall system planning and reliability picture is, is really important. We're, we're, as has been discussed by others in other states, we're fundamentally transitioning the system. And, and I know as a regulator and as a power systems engineer that this aggregate load is really important, but we got to do the details and the math to fit it in. And so um, I think um, making sure that we're getting it into the resource plans, making it sure we're getting into the regional planning, uh, making sure that NERC's reliability assessments are really accounting for it, which they're not. Um, they're really focused on supply side. I'm engaged at NERC um, through the states and with Nehru. And I think they understand the theory of load flexibility, but it's not fundamentally going in in the detail. And the same is my experience with, with MISO and ISO. But yet when we have the extreme storms where we see that we've come up to the edge, uh, um, uh, the demand response and flexibility has been a critical piece. And we've just got to connect these and get the value um, uh, assessed and, and, and put together. Um, and I would say, um, from my perspective, again, as a regulator, that I understand the importance of these. It's something that we're working on in Minnesota, and we're really looking to the folks in this room to bring us solutions and things that we can, um, things that we can um, implement and move forward on. So um, I, I implore people to make that case. And I think that um, if I was regulating in Pearl States or she was, you, uh, distributing electricity in my state, I think there'd be a lot going forward. It's not like your regulators are doing it, but I appreciate the framing that was brought there. Yeah, definitely. And it seems like there's more people at the party now, yeah. right? <laughs> um, great. So a couple more questions. So let's think about a little bit more forward. Um, so what's next? Uh, Kevin, with uh, VP3, since it's a new initiative that was just launched last month, is that right? Can't believe that. 
it, it was just lost last, last month. Um, so what's next for VP3 to help the adoption of virtual power plants? Yeah, so I, I mentioned in the slide the three types of activities we do, and I didn't get a chance to mention sort of what we'll be doing specifically. Um, so on, on the convening side of things, we are uh, hosting our first member convening in, um, in April up at our office in Basalt, Colorado, and that's really going to be a chance for us to get together with our members, lay the roadmap. We've been hearing from our members, but sort of one of the things we really like to do is bring together members, identify the working groups we'll be advancing. Um, the another thing on the education front, uh, you know, a couple things that I'm hearing is we need new research uh, and analysis on some important topics, um, including, you know, some questions around the greenhouse gas impact, some questions about what are best practices for, um, you know, for, how do we understand the reliability impact? How do we measure and verify what VPPs provide? And I'm also hearing. Uh, we also need the two page version of what other people have done on this. So I think when it comes to the education side of things, what we're going to try to do is, is, is both of those things, finding ways to translate the work that's out there um, and also uh, identifying where is there the need for research that either we can help fill the gap um, or others can help fill the gap. Um, and then finally, when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to directly engaging, I think, uh, you know, regulators, utilities, please reach out to us. We want to be a resource. Uh, we want to be, uh, be able to uh, help educate. We want to help be a conduit to our members who are deeply engaged on these topics. Um, and we want to be able to participate uh, in dockets wherever we can be helpful. Thank you. And I, I was just reminded that we have 10 minutes left. I can't believe that this time has flown by. There's just so much here. Um, and. So I'm just trying to go quickly and, and make sure that we have some the closing questions. And um, so, Seth, what do you think are the barriers? I know that we talked a little bit earlier about some of the barriers um, for more VPPs on the transmission distribution. I know um, Commissioner Sugar had just mentioned that too on the electric system. But from your perspective, what are what what would you add to that conversation? I would add two things: um, equity. Uh, I'd love to see, I think a bunch of people have touched on this in small ways, right? How can you make sure it's not just the adopter, today's adopters of IoT DERs, right? How do you get the next gen, the, the, the customers who are potentially going to be left behind? Um, or at the very least, how do we make sure that the benefits of the programs are targeting, for example, can we eliminate um, a, a peaker that's sited in a, in a um, neighborhood that's creating an environmental justice issue? So I think that's number one. And then I think the other, the, the second would be sort of credibility. I think to get integration to happen, to get the distribution engineers to trust this, to get the folks at NERC to pay attention to this, we need to just be talking constantly about, about the successes, right? We need to make sure that it, the, 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 the sort of experience curve is identical at every utility I've seen. You start the program small. People are saying, like, I would never use that. I couldn't trust it, blah, blah, blah. Then it shows up on a particular day when they need it. They try it. They're like, oh, that actually worked. And then they're like, can I try it again? And after a little while, they become they begin to trust it. You can get ahead of that by just starting to work across silos within a utility, encourage people to just try it and sort of experience, basically test drive the VPPs so that they're getting that experience in advance and going up that learning curve as early as possible. I think that those are really fantastic points and really it could actually overlay on top of each other where we start in the in the um, the areas of disadvantaged communities and start those conversations and you know knowing that it's a pilot I, I think that that would be fantastic to see that um, come to fruition. Sorry, selfish there. Sorry. Um, <laughs> going back to um, so Pearl for um, from a utilities perspective, what do you think can help help us all scale? Um, the benefits and, and capture some of these opportunities that are that are in front of us now. So what's that said? So I think that for a utility, it is seeing it, it is feeling it, it is understanding how does this work? How does this work from a system planning? They, when we're talking to our planners and our engineers, they need to see it. So pilots are incredibly important. That's how you start to operationalize it, understand what you can do, understand what you can't do, and really build that confidence. So what, what's that said? I think the other piece, which I don't think we're talking about as much, is the markets need to evolve. When we're looking out at market prices and market signals and we're saying, hey, will these programs pay for themselves? Our, uh, 
elk neck VPP, which again is so important because we are learning so much and it is working across those silos and we are getting our energy acquisition team to talk to our control center in very appropriate ways that do not challenge any existing legal rules. It's very <laughs> clear for our commissioners and lawyers in the room, but to have some of those conversations and that had a benefit cost ratio of 0 0.3. So we need to accept that when we're in this learning phase that it is about learning and if we're going to understand what are the capabilities that people need that utilities need to operate these well. That we do need to really understand that this is learning, we need to pilot those programs to be able to, to, be able to work through it. and the markets and the flexibility valuing that flexibility will help us uh, improve from a 0.3. Do you mind if I throw one quick little thought absolutely VPPs are basically software defined power plants right so I. You, you, you can, in a way, you can redefine what the meaning of pilot. You can take a commercial scale program and experiment on that program. You could say, okay, we're running this grid service as a four hour load shift program, but what would happen if we tried this other thing with it? You can completely in software just move groups of customers around, say, let's, tr let's try this new thing with batteries or with, uh, with thermostats or whatever, and just try it. And you, it can be, you can simulate it first in software and then you can try it in the real world, but doing it entirely within something that is already funded, it doesn't necessarily come at the cost of the main goal of the program. You can just try it on the side. Yes, as long as, yes, as long as we continue to keep the customers engaged and yes, absolutely. Um, Final thoughts, Commissioner uh, Sugar. Um, what are your, what are what other informations and insights would help you um, think through some of the system planning challenges ahead, um, and some of the concerns that you have brought up, yes. which are very valid. So, just a couple of quick things, um, particularly to the commissions, um, regulatory folks in the room. It's really important to get started on preparing the system. As we're talking about this, we, we know we need these resources. They're important, they're valuable resources, and we need them at scale, and they are gonna affect and change the distribution system. So um, um, getting interconnection rules updated now, getting uh, distribution planning and transparency in place now. Uh, they, aren't, they aren't really heavy lifts for commissions, and there's great resources at NARUC um, and at um, DOE working together to commissions to do that. So get started on those things. And I'm gonna pile on the last point from a regulatory uh, perspective. Uh, we are working at our commission, and I would urge other commissions um, to try to work towards trying stuff. Um, you know, pilots, um, some, of the, some of the stuff you have to look at and say, really, do I, do I need to pilot it? Can we, can we just get going on this? But I think often in the regulatory world, we get, we get hung up uh, on the, the, the perfect being the enemy of the good. And we need the speed we need to move at um, to the point of my other panelists and other speakers. Uh, we're working at our commission and I would urge other commissioners to try things and move on if they, you know, learn some things and then move on and try some more things. Definitely in full agreement there. So that was, that concludes our panel questions. I want to just open it up. We have five minutes left, I think maybe less to um, take some audience questions. So I think the HG has a question there and we'll take the next one too. Hi everyone, HG Chazelle, Advanced Energy Group. Uh, my question goes to the gentleman from RNI. You showed those lists of benefits at the beginning on virtual power plants. Do you have associated top line metrics for each of those benefits so we can understand progress towards delivering on those benefits, especially on the health and equity one you mentioned? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Just to clarify, that would be like the objective of what we're trying to work towards is what the desired outcome is, or sort of like what we're seeing current benchmarks. Right. Well, you show them as like, these are the benefits you can get from virtual power plants. But how do we verify that those benefits are accruing or are being delivered? What would be the metric to determine success as a, as a benefit? Yeah, it's a great question. And the exactly right question. I mean, I, I think I can point to the units, if not the exact numbers, right? But I, I think to, to go through those, reliability is complex. Maybe I'll, you know, I think we have a sense of what that looks like. Affordability, you know, I, I think there's a few ways that we, we can measure it, right? Are you talking about specific customer savings for participating customers? I think we focus on bulk system savings. Um, decarbonization that's something we're really interested in quantifying and just to like 
pause on that. Yeah, we see the impact of avoiding dispatch of certain peakers. How can we also induce more investment in clean solutions? Likewise, electrification, how can we defray the cost of electrification and in some instances induce additional investment in an EV, et cetera? Um, you know, I, I, to the health and equity one, I think that's really important. I think it's an important question that we saw show up earlier and one that we need to circle back on. Um, you know, I, I think I'll point, you know, and Seth, you, you addressed this well earlier, health and equity or, you know, putting them together is conflating them a little bit there. They are two separate things. Um, they're related in some instances. So when we talk about the health benefit, we're really looking to the ability to avoid in many instances, natural gas peakers that have had negative impacts on communities. Then it really comes down to which peaker, which community, how do we measure that? Um, I think there's examples out there we can point to, and we're really looking to find more examples. And I think there's a lot of communities that are impacted by natural gas peakers that are looking to find solutions. You know, and that's one that's not measured so much as sort of gigawatts across the country, but it's more like this community, this community, this community. It's very sort of location based as I as I see it. Um, and then I, you know, I think the other one when it comes to equity, I, I think sort of. Uh, you know, I think a lot of it's sort of the equi equitable distribution of the impacts and the benefits. Again, that's complex. I think sort of a couple principles and, you know, Seth, you, you laid this out well. I, you know, I think one, as we've discussed, is sort of cost shifting. And one thing that's worth recognizing, we're very early stage with many of these things. We want to avoid cost shifting and setting up a system that's sort of like shifting costs over time. And I think as we've heard, it is appropriate to be finding ways to, you know, if, if your benefit your benefit cost is less than one, that is okay and that's appropriate right now. Um, we want to find ways to avoid long-term cost shifting. And then I think the other thing that's come up is how can we uh, encourage participation by folks who might not otherwise be uh, currently adopting some of these solutions. So I, I hope that addresses, you know, some of what you were getting at and I think, you know, come talk to us because we really want to hear about how, how can we measure this? How can we make sure that we're tracking? Yeah, it's an open I actually oh. add in just really quick because I think some of this <laughs> is on program design too. So from a utility <clears throat> perspective, and I will be really quick because I know we want to yes, go. Yes, yes. We've well, been certainly I mean, leaning on the administration's uh, Justice 40 initiative. So when we did our last round of decarbonization programs that we put forward uh, in the district, that was one of the ways that we were looking at at equity and related to health because the transportation electrification program and we know that those emissions and the siting of certain land uses has been in predominantly under resourced communities so from a program design perspective when we're looking at how are we getting customers into these programs and what are those benefits we've leaned on tools like justice 40 and the mapping that helps us target those incentives to get into the program Hopefully that was great. Yeah, yeah. No, that was great. I'm, I'm sorry. I know that there are more questions. And I just want to at least take a moment to thank the, the panelists for their insights and sharing their, their perspective on how we do this. Thank you, guys. I'll ask the panelists to stay seated. I'm going to do a really quick closing. I mean, I just thank you, all of you. And thank you, all of you. This is better than we could have ever expected. We had over 100 folks joining us online. I think we've had 200 plus uh, register for this event in person. And you're still here. And it's four o'clock <laughs> and it's been an incredible week. I mean, we've, we've heard so much about, you know, it, the lack of uh, VPPs is not a technology problem, it's a policy problem. And one of the things that I'm proud about doing at SEPA, the Smart Electric Power Alliance, is that we're looking for actionable solutions. You know, we're a 501c3 of 1,100 members, utilities, investor-owned utilities, co-ops, and public power. Um, we have a lot of our corporate members, including Energy Hub. Seth is on my board. And we're working with commissions and consumer advocates and other stakeholders in this area. So. For us, VPPs are going to be an important topic going forward. We heard from the commissioner that you're looking for solutions. We're here to educate and help find those solutions. I want to thank LPO and the fantastic staff and the many that are still here today that helped us with this. I want to say thank you to the NARIC staff. You're wonderful. We really appreciate you. My fabulous staff, thank you so much for being here. Um, I would be remiss if I did not say that the slides and the survey will be sent to attendees in the next 
power. Um, and again, HG, I appreciate you bringing up equity and keeping that in the center. I mean, that's what we do at SEPA, and I know that's what we're thinking about going forward, and, and that's how we kicked off the general session at Neighborhood. So I think that's a nice bookend to this week. So thank you again for being here. Uh, we look forward to continue the dialogue. Again, this is just the first conversation that we're having on this. There will be many more to come. So thank you again.